Lizzie Borden took an axe. She gave her mother forty wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father forty one. <laughs>《Hi there, I'm Christina Pichols, actor and wannabe sleuth, and this is Hollywood or History, where I break down Hollywood takes on true crime stories. In today's episode, I examine the legend of Lizzie Borden, a 1974 film starring Elizabeth Montgomery that follows the infamous double murder trial of 1892. Warning: spoilers ahead. Hello and good afternoon. Welcome to we'll call it True Crime Tuesdays. I guess. <laughs> Thanks, Dana. Look at me with a fancy intro. I'm trying. <laughs> I also uh, it was a good excuse to record a creepy song. And、uh, welcome to my murder wall. It's a work in progress. Definitely going to be added to, but、uh, yes, I possess hatchets, as you do. <laughs> oh, so today's episode is focusing on the 1975 movie,、um, The Legend of Lizzie Borden, which, as you might guess, is about Lizzie Borden and the infamous double murder. Of her parents, that still remains unsolved because she was acquitted, which is a whole thing. So, right off the bat, I will say this movie is probably more historically accurate than one would expect. <laughs> it's certainly more than、um, its predecessors, which will come later. So. Because this one was actually、um, on YouTube, in case you didn't see that. Hold on, I gotta situate my mic again. You guys know how I am. Oh, one day, one day, me and my mic will get along. Okay. <laughs> Well, that's a、uh, that's a little bit creepy, Amanda. That any time I stream, you get a phone call about your car's extended warranty. <laughs> Not sure why. All right, so、um, I kind of made a little slideshow, I guess, of just some screenshots, so that I can like go through this thing with some. Rhythm, I guess. I don't know. Order. We're gonna pretend I have order. <laughs> We're gonna pretend she knows what she's doing. She doesn't. Oh no! I've cut. I've cropped out my. There we go. Can't crop out the hatchet. So,、um, right off the top of the film, you've got Hollywood's favorite uh, favorite uh, disclaimer. That this story you are about to see is based largely on fact. It is considered one of the most infamous and bizarre murder cases of the past century, which I will agree with. It remains <laughs> so, but we're going to determine whether or not this、uh, film is based mostly or largely on fact. We'll say, because、um, the more I read. The more curious I become. Now, there are the trial transcripts do survive.、Um, if you want to give them a read,、um, LizzieAndrewBorden.com seems to be like the best website for everything. So that is where you want to go if you want to read them. So the trial itself is pretty lengthy. I still haven't made it through all the trial testimony. I focused on. The ones that come into this film for now, 
And interestingly enough, Lizzie Borden never took the stand in her own trial, but she did testify in an inquest, a coroner's inquest, which those transcripts also survive. But because she wasn't allowed a, a lawyer at the uh, inquest, they threw it out of the trial. So it's essentially like she never testified under oath regarding this case. And after reading her testimony in that inquest, I can absolutely understand why her lawyer was like, we got to get this fucking tossed in the shitter. Um, it is ooh, a fun read. <laughs> uh, it is very lengthy. There's two parts to it. And it reminds me of a certain somebody because uh, she'll answer one question one way and then ask the same question will change the answer to the point where it, it becomes very confusing. Now in the trial, they, they bring in the doctor to say he's been giving her morphine since the murders and they're trying to blame this disastrous testimony and her inconsistencies to the investigators and all of that on this morphine. So very interesting. Um, obviously, it's possible. Um, I see people asking, yes, this is going to be very different from Rob's stream. I'm actually focusing on the film and how they go through it. And then um, I, I think I'm actually going to have to have an entire episode down to my theories, the myths, and the other suspects, because um, almost none of these films actually dive into uh, any other some suspect. Like, that just never happens. It's actually a very interesting thing. They never, ever present um, the uncle. He's barely mentioned at all, ever. And that was one of the stronger suspects. And there is some discrepancies in that testimony. So that's its own thing. That's its own thing. But he, the only mention Uncle John, this guy, gets in this film is the brief uh, reference to him and the father's will. That's it. He's not even presented as being present. He just from the story. <laughs> so that's interesting. Um, they do hint at several things, though, that fall into the, the myths category. And I actually started to get the sense that they were trying to shove a lot of them in with uh, usually they stick to a flashback scene. So but let's let's go on. Let's go forward. So this film actually opens right, you know, on the day of the murders, gets right into the action. So this is a pretty cool establishing shot, too, because they 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 come in on the clock, the town clock striking 11 a.m. Now. Can't be entirely accurate <laughs> based on testimony because Maggie the maid, I'm just going to call her that even though her name is Bridget. We're going to call her Maggie the maid because it sounds fun. Um, in her testimony says that she heard the clock strike 11 when she was upstairs in the attic. And that's when she claims Lizzie called out to her. So we're doing a tiny little time lapse here because the next shot is the maid running across the, the street to go get the doctor. So not exact, but close enough. We'll take it. Now, this is this is what gets fun. So according to both Lizzie and her neighbor, Mrs. Churchill, um, as the maid is running across the street and down the street looking for help, Miss Churchill, Mrs. Churchill, I think, 
is coming home from the grocery store and sees the maid and thinks that's a little odd, right? So she then looks uh, out her window, which faces the Borden residence, and she sees Lizzie standing at the screen door. So she goes out and she walks up to her and she asks her what's going on. And this is when Lizzie, um, according to testimony, says some interesting things. And there's actually something that is testified to here by Mrs. Churchill that completely gets abandoned in the film, in the plot, and contradicts and creates a huge problem for Lizzie. Um, as you can see, she says, I opened the window and said, Lizzie, what is the matter? Oh, Mrs. Churchill, do come over. Someone has killed father. Now down below, she's asked again. And she says, I go up to the door. Oh, Lizzie, where is your father? She said, in the sitting room. And I said, where were you when it happened? And she said, I went to the barn to get a piece of iron. Where is your mother? According to Mrs. Churchill, Lizzie said, I don't know. She had got a note to go somewhere to see someone who is sick, but I don't know. But she is killed too, for I thought I heard her come in. And it's actually that line that she is killed too that um, really needs more attention because she goes on to say to everyone else in the house that she doesn't know where the mother is, that she thought the mother was out, but then she does say, oh, but I think I heard her come back. But right here, according to Mrs. Churchill, she's saying right out the gate that both of them are dead. Or she's just assuming it either. That's interesting because the uh, every every interpretation implies that no one else knew that there was another body. And so right here, it sounds like Lizzie knew and she knew exactly where she was. Hmm. So suspect. And of course they come inside. I'm, I'm, I'm not using the most graphic images, so no worries. These are just the movie stills. <laughs> so Lizzie, and Mrs. Churchill come inside and Mrs. Churchill is one of the first ones to see the father's body. And he is, of course, lying dead on the sofa in the sitting room. So this is where the maid, Maggie, Maggie the maid has returned after fetching Alice Russell. And Alice Russell also has some interesting uh, issues in this story. <laughs> I am um, I'm really starting to develop the theory that a lot of these people um, accidentally got involved in a cover-up. And I'm going to get into that way more down the road. But... Um, it, it all revolves around the dress. And I actually think the dress is maybe deserves a lot more attention than people are giving it. But Lizzie and Alice and Mrs. Churchill are all sitting in the sitting room. Dr. Bowen from across the street comes over, checks out her father's body, determines, yep, he's dead. And then they have the exchange about where is Mrs. Borden? Where is Mrs. Borden? Well, the film here takes a slightly different liberty because Maggie the maid and Mrs. Churchill go up the stairs to look for Mrs. Borden. Now, according to Maggie, she actually goes all the way into the room and stands at the foot of Mrs. Borden. Um, in the film here, they have them both only seeing the body from the staircase, which is possible. That's what Mrs. Churchill said. She saw this and she didn't go any further. But 
Maggie testifies that she went all the way into the room and stood at the foot of Mrs. Borden. But she was definitely freaked out about it. <laughs> and uh, interestingly, Maggie gets out of Dodge pretty quick. We'll elaborate more down the road. So now we have found out that there are two dead bodies. Mrs. Borden was in fact killed as well. So I, I, I swear, I think I'm going to end up making a whole entire episode about the dress because it does appear that the uh, costumers here went with um, Lizzie Borden's description of her dress that day, but they definitely took, I think, Hollywood liberties here in that they made it a lot more form fitting than everyone describes what she was wearing. But because even Lizzie says that her blouse was loose and um, this dress is not that. This is also the but the reason I do say I think they went with uh, the closer to what Lizzie describes, which is a problem in and itself. But Lizzie does describe this. It's not quite silk. It's banglia or something. And she, she describes it as a skirt and a blouse. So it's not a singular piece dress. She does say it's like a navy blue. But what she's describing is apparently more of an evening dress. And this looks like more of an evening dress. And... Pretty much every lady they ask is like, I don't see why she would have been wearing an evening dress in the morning when she wasn't going out. Which makes sense. Ladies know things. And there is not a singular testimony that matches this shit. It's just a fucking drain wreck from start to finish. <laughs> um and then there's the question of what dress did she give the police officers? Because assumingly it's this one. Um, that's why this dress deserves its own freaking story. And the dress is mysteriously gone. So here you can see the back of it just a little bit. You can see that it is two pieces. It's a skirt and a blouse. And... But it, you see how it's form fitting across the waist, really tight, actually. Um, there's the Alice and Mrs. Churchill both testify that it was much looser around the middle. There was a moment they were going to loosen her dress because she was feeling faint. And she said, oh, no, it's plenty loose. So, yeah, it, it doesn't really match up. But then again, there are apparently no images of the dress, which I find odd. I understand it would have been in black and white, but, you know, this dress, they did get a dress and it was in evidence. And there was supposedly all this forensics done on it, which forensics at the time, you know. And never a photograph. Or if there was a photograph, the photograph hasn't survived. So I... I'm on a mission now to find this dress um, because I, I think whatever Lizzie described that she was wearing and the one that she gave the police officers is, is not the one she was wearing that morning, <laughs> whether she committed a murder in it or not. It just doesn't make sense. So um, they, of course there's Mrs. Borden's body. They did a pretty good job matching up the uh, crime scenes, I think. Probably need more blood spatter, but hard to determine from the photographs. <laughs> so the next next thing that we have happen, you know, they do show the, the police officers arriving, the crowd gathering outside, all of that, the usual. But then they have Emma showing up. And I think they make a lot of interesting choices with Emma in that... In this scene, the very first thing that Emma asks Lizzie is, did you kill father? 
So right out the gate, it would it would seem that the uh, the writers of the film would like to believe that Emma Borden suspected her own sister, and they they stick to that pretty good. Now, I have not finished reading all of Emma's testimony. I don't think um, they they recall a lot of people several times. So still working my way through it, but I will say there are a lot of contradictions and things that might again imply that several of these women at the very least knew that Lizzie wasn't being completely truthful or covering something up and they just wanted to, you know, help her out. Um, I would, I would think that if anyone knew for sure, it would either be Emma or Bridget, AKA Maggie, the maid. Um, but this is her coming in and asking Lizzie right out the gate, did you kill father? Lizzie, of course, says no. <laughs> I would never. Um, now, <laughs> the costume choice in this scene is, I don't know, maybe they ran out of budget. Um, I mean, she was, she did allegedly change into, well, actually, this is pretty confirmed. She changed into a rapper, which is significantly different than address um and this looks like it's supposed to be a wrapper but it's layered on top of something else i don't know it's just ugly we'll go with that um because i actually i don't think i got it in the slides but i actually have been pulling uh accurate photographs and um patterns from the time and uh that's not exactly what they mean by a wrapper um Basically, a wrapper was just a house dress that you could pull on pretty easy and cinch at the waist. Um, I don't know what this thing is supposed to be. It's just ugly. And then she's wearing this other thing underneath. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they were trying to go with. She threw that on so you couldn't see the blood. I don't know. Now, they definitely really, really run home with uh, Emma being the mother here. Um, again, it goes to Emma knows Lizzie better than anyone. Emma takes care of Lizzie. Emmy know, Emma knows all things. Um, you know, that does seem accurate based on everyone's testimony. Emma was much older than Lizzie. So she, you know, was asked on her mother's deathbed to take care, take care of your sister. So this sounds like it all adds up. Um, however, I, I really, 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 really want everyone to just focus on this cap on Emma's head because I said in my last, uh, stream when we were just, you know, chatting, this was very common for women to do in this time period. Very common. Every woman would have had one of these. Almost every woman would have slept with one on her head. You know, they didn't wash their hair every day. They didn't get to do their hair every day. So you would, you know, to prolong your style and all of that, you would sleep with a cap on. Now, what's really fascinating is nobody ever puts a cap on Lizzie Borden's head. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure that would take care of the blood and the hair part, you guys. But okay. Nobody ever do that. Nobody ever think of that. But I have thought of it. And here it is. I think it's really interesting that the costume department throws one on Emma's head. But no one, no one does that to Lizzie. Just, just wait to see how ridiculous it gets with the costume and the wardrobe and the, and the, oh, oh, the hair. Oh, the hair. Um, I'll also add that according to uh, Lizzie herself, and it sounds like everyone else, um, she was also wearing black stockings that day. So again, stockings. See, I know things. Um, so this is why I'm like, you don't need to strip naked. What are you talking about? Are you kidding? A, a dress that reaches the floor is the best thing. It's basically a drop cloth. You just rip it off. <laughs> oh, gosh. Wrap. Yeah, the dress was torn up and wrapped, and they wrapped meat in it. Sure. Um, so now this scene is both like this is the night of the murders, 
And this scene is both like accurate and in in and inaccurate at the same time. And I can't speak. Um, so according to one of the police officers, at about eleven o'clock, they saw Lizzie Borden descending the stairs, or they saw a lamp for sure. And then they saw her washing something in a sink. Now, Alice Russell says that it was the both of them that um, Lizzie had a slop pail, which I'm assuming means, you know, dirty things. Um, and they were taking it down to the cellar. Um, and so she says, we go down there. One of them is carrying the lamp. The other one is carrying the pail. They go down there. And she says, Lizzie goes into the washroom and dumps this pail and rinses it out. She doesn't go all the way in. So she's just chilling by the doorway, I guess, as you do. Um, and that does leave an interesting uh, window there because... Sure, maybe they're just doing the usual things in the house where the murders happened and the bodies are still in the other, in the, on the dining room table. That's where the bodies were. None of this, of course, would happen in today's world. The house would be a crime scene. Nobody would be sleeping in it all night. Um, in fact, they locked the suspects in the murder house. Brilliant. Br brilliant. Let's, let's just give them perfect time and ample opportunity to... Uh, or perfect opportunity and ample time either way to, you know, fix their mess. <laughs> like, yeah, let's do that. So, but in this, in this film, this gets weird. They have her going down the stairs instead of with this pail going into the basement and rinsing anything in a sink. Instead, she goes down and she uh, sees her dead parents in the dining room and kisses her father, which I, I, I spared you guys because I mean, first off, they, they don't have half of his head missing. So I'm like, no, but <laughs> I'm like, okay, that's uh, that's definitely some artistic liberties there. There's no evidence of that happening. In fact, it's like I said, allegedly, something worse, something in my opinion that is way worse. Her going down to the cellar and potentially disposing of something. Not suspect at all. So then they cut to the funeral, which the funerals are held in the house and then the bodies are taken away. Um, but this little exchange here where they inform the undertaker that, um, you know, hey, after you get to the grave sites, you don't get to put the bodies in the ground. We're going to go take their heads off. Don't tell the family. Yeah, that's accurate, unfortunately. Um, they did that. <laughs> and they didn't tell the family. So, score. Um, they, they, they shoved it in there pretty well, as you do. Um, now, I caught this because it was literally just last night. I read um, somebody's testimony, and I thought, well, this is uh, interesting. Because as you can see, they have Lizzie here at the funeral and she's not wearing a black dress. She's wearing some fancy looking silk burgundy blue number. And there's some ladies in this scene that are like judging her because she's not wearing black. Um, this is completely artistic liberty here because uh, the testimony I read, Lizzie Borden actually did wear a black net dress to the funeral, something like that. So, um, this goes with, I think, trying to push that public perception that she was off, um, but it's not accurate. So no points for that one. Um, next up, they this is accurate. They do come over to the house and this is the, uh, the moment they tell Lizzie Borden she is the suspect. And then they put the whole family under house arrest again in the murder house <laughs> as you do so lizzie emma um alice russell stayed there a few nights and john uncle john um was there now the maid 
this is this gets interesting. The maid did not stay there the night of the murder, and then the next night she stayed at the neighbor's with another maid. So the maid was really sufficiently freaked out. She was like, I want out of here. She did come back to work for a short time. Then um, it sounds like they sent her to work for the prison guard as uh, some form of her house arrest. I, I got the vibe that the goal was to separate them, which makes sense because these were the only two people in the house when these two murders occurred. So I'd separate them too. But it seems like the maid was more than happy to get out of Dodge. Um, and then in the real world, there's a story about uh, Lizzie Borden's uh, attorney giving her a substantial sum of money to go to Ireland, to go back to Ireland after the trial. So, you know, that goes in the hmm, interesting box. Does not come into this film, of course, because again, mm, there are a few things that go towards conspiracy, but most of the films stick pretty firm to Lizzie Borden did it and here's how she did it. So the trial inquest, this is where it gets fun. So the maid apparently did testify at the trial inquest, but as I was looking for something, um, I found a little notation and then I looked again and I was like, oh, huh. The maid's testimony from the trial inquest did not survive. That's the notation I found. Um, don't know what happened to it when it got lost because as she testifies in the trial, they ask her about things that she said in the inquest and it sounds like they're quoting. So presumably they still had it at that time, but I'd love to know where it went because I got questions. Um, but so here they take some liberties and they shoehorn in her testimony from the trial or parts of it into the inquest so that they can start setting the scene of how the day played out, but they start with from her perspective. So it's a it's like a half half and half here because her testimony, it does actually sound almost word for word from trial testimony. And I will give them that in most of these scenes, they're very close. There are some exchanges that are word for word. Others are kind of mixed together in order to shorten it, I would assume for time. Um, but they, they clearly did actually, you know, take the transcripts and use them. And that's more than you get from most productions. So kudos on that. Um, so Maggie tells her version of the story, you know, it was a hot day. I got up at six, I made breakfast. Now, once again, no mention of Uncle John. <laughs> he just doesn't exist. <laughs> no mention of the mysterious uncle staying or having breakfast or any of that, um, even though it is testified to by everyone. So Hollywood was just like, nah, we don't need another suspect. We don't want to confuse people. Bye. So she tells the story, you know, her her account seems pretty similar. There are some discrepancies, which I've noticed and I'm looking for more. That's why I would love to have her inquest testimony, but apparently it just poofed. What a shame. So she goes to washing the windows at some point. This is when allegedly the first murder occurs. And, you know, she does have a solid alibi. She talks to the other maid across the street. She also says she had to go to the barn to get the water, and she may have gone back and forth like six or seven times. 
Now, Lizzie is supposed to still be in the house at this time, but Lizzie's testimony is, again, a mess. She goes from the kitchen to the sitting room, to the dining room, to the kitchen, to the sitting room, to the dining room. Maybe she goes upstairs. She can't remember. She thinks she did, but she's not sure. But she says at first she was in the kitchen or the sitting room when her father came back. But then she says, no, maybe I was upstairs. But then she says, no. Eh, yeah, that's how it goes. It's a whole mess. Now, this is they're using Bridget's testimony here, but this is artistic liberty. This shot right here, not accurate because Bridget, Maggie, says she hears Lizzie laughing from upstairs, but she does not see her, which I find fascinating because this is when, you know, allegedly, Stepmommy's being murdered. She's being hatcheted to death. <laughs> so if Lizzie was upstairs, but no one sees her, well, she could have been covered in blood. She could have been up there cleaning herself off, having a giggle. Um, the implication is that she's laughing at Maggie, who's struggling to open the door and says probably some curse word or something. They they do let the maid curse a few times in this movie. It's kind of funny. It's always like under her breath. But I, I think they wanted to imply that she was uh, a lot more fiery and talk backy than she probably was. And also she was only 26. So we're talking about a very young woman and she's an immigrant from Ireland. And so, yeah, maybe she had some, you know, fire to her personality, but I don't know about all this. I mean, some of her testimony and things that she did say does imply that, you know, maybe she's not a little pushover, but anyways, this shot, meh, it's just there because, you know, you, you can't, you can't show her any other way. But what's interesting is they have her later in the film looking over and seeing the dead body and laughing. So there's that. Um, now, oh, got to go back. Sorry. So this is when uh, Father Borden returns home. And this is the part I've actually always been curious about because... So they do have a shot. Let me see if it's after this one. Oh, maybe I didn't get it. They actually do utilize the clocks pretty cleverly in this film. So they, they come in on this clock at one point and they show 1040, which is pretty accurate if you believe Bridget's testimony. Um, there is a neighbor that says they thought they saw him returning home at about 1035. So that adds up. Bridget says, first she says it's 1040, then she changes it to 1055, which becomes a big problem. There's a couple of problems with the timetable. But I thought it was, it was a really clever way of getting it in there that, like, if you look at the clock, it says 1040. So this particular exchange, Lizzie testifies to speaking to her father when he arrives. Bridget says she overhears them speaking, but never sees Lizzie, which is interesting. So the whole thing where, you know, they see each other on, she sees her on the stairs or she passes her, didn't happen. She says she lets the father in. She goes back to washing the windows in the sitting room or the dining room. And the father has a conversation. She just overhears it. But she only hears Lizzie ask about mail. And then she just like tunes out. Apparently she's like, I didn't hear anything else. Which is honestly kind of suspicious. Like, I get that you're the you know, the maid. So you're probably used to just tuning out and not listening to conversations, but it, it does sound like parts of their stories align a little too much. 
You know what I'm saying? Like a little too much. Like you got the same words and all that jazz. And then they just forget the rest. I don't, I don't remember the rest, but the other part is, and, and this is where it is kind of interesting because when Lizzie testifies, she says she doesn't see Maggie at all after Maggie goes out and starts washing windows she she's in the dining room in the kitchen and doing her ironing and all that jazz and claims that she and Bridget never pass which is a big problem because Bridget's like I'm in the I'm inside washing the windows in the dining room in the sitting room and Lizzie's saying she's going from these room, going, you know, back and forth through these rooms. So something ain't adding up there. These two women who say, oh, no, I didn't, I didn't see her and she didn't see me and da, 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 but y'all are both supposedly going in and out of the same rooms. Okay, sure. Sure, Jan. Sure. Something's not jiving with that part of the story, which makes me wonder if this even happened. Because we only have Lizzie and uh, Maggie to say that, you know, after, let's say, stepmom gets hatcheted to death, that Lizzie saw her father alive. And presumably he saw her, right? But if you remove this exchange at all, like it didn't happen, Lizzie was upstairs doing who knows what. And then the maid hears her cackle. <laughs> As you do. And then the next thing that happens is uh, there's another dead body. This whole question of how would Lizzie have murdered her stepmother, gotten cleaned up, gotten dressed again, gone downstairs, spoke to her father, then murdered her father, then gotten cleaned up again. That That's not even a necessary puzzle to unravel if this didn't happen. And the only people we have saying it did are these two women who were in the house <laughs> together. And if Bridget is like saying, you know, I only heard them speak, I didn't see them. Well, that leaves a lot of possibilities open. Why are, you, why are you conveniently not seeing anybody? But she says she saw the father go sit in the dining room in the rocking chair where she was in the same room with him for a while. And then he goes into this other room, the sitting room, and lays down. So a whole lot of confusion happening there. But this is, you know, the version where they take their word for it that this exchange occurs. Then they do have the exchange where Lizzie says to the maid, hey, you know, there's like this dress sale. You should go get some. Which kind of does sound like she was trying to get her out of the house. Um, now, this is, of course, what Bridget testifies to. Lizzie doesn't remember this, doesn't testify to it. Again, I didn't see her. I don't know what she's talking about. Um, now, this could be one of two things. It could be Maggie trying to get herself out of the shit. Like, uh, uh, uh. She, she, she's trying to make it sound like Lizzie is suspicious. You know, there's a few things that do kind of point in that direction. Like, she suspects her. Or she's trying to throw the suspicion onto her. But there's also other times where it sounds like she's trying to help her out. So I'm like, hmm, interesting. Like changing the time. But that also helps Bridget out. Because there's a big difference between a 20 to 30 minute window for a murder and what would essentially be five minutes. Which actually turns to like three or four. And it's not, well, I did that wrong. But yeah. Yeah. But this is a testimony that she gives and she says this exchange occurred. So it's there. Now, this isn't wholly accurate. This is back to breakfast. I don't know how I got this out of order, but 
Uh, Lizzie didn't have breakfast with the, anyone that morning. In fact, we need to replace Lizzie Borden with Uncle John. Okay? Yeah, that would be more accurate. Lizzie didn't sit there at breakfast. She didn't come down. Everyone agreed to that. Everyone agreed to that. So it was Uncle John and Mr. and Mrs. Borden had, had breakfast together. Lizzie came down later, had a cup of coffee, maybe some cookies. She can't remember. She can't remember a lot of things. So now we're in the inquest. Oh, back to the inquest. So as I said, Lizzie Borden testifies in the inquest, not a trial. And her inquest testimony is worth a read because it is a shitstorm. <laughs> There's actually two volumes. <laughs> She's asked a lot of questions. And there is a lot of repetitiveness. But again, I think they start doing that because she keeps changing her story. Just back and forth, back and forth. Can't remember this. Don't know. I don't know. Yes, no. Yes, no. It, it's a mess. Now, they do actually pull word for word at points in this. So that's awesome. Um, and then they just, they again, they just shorten it a lot. So they focus on um, the will questions. You know, did he have a will? Did you know about a will? And again, that's about the only mention Uncle John gets. That's it. Um, she says, I think I heard about it from my Uncle John some years ago. That's all. Um, she can't remember where she was, what she was doing. She changes her mind a lot. Uh, she's asked, why did you stop calling her mother? You know, I don't know. I just wanted to. <laughs> so she does come off as, as cagey and confused at the same time, like a lot. Um, but I'll give them points for the accuracy of this. However, um, there was one thing that I, I liked in the film that I was looking to see if it was in the transcripts, if this was a real exchange, and I did not find it in the transcripts. So I have to say that it's probably completely fictional. But what I liked was that the judge at the end of her testimony in the movie turns to her and says, you know, I'd love to say you were not guilty, but if you were a man sitting in front of me and all the facts were the same, I'd have to say you are probably guilty. And that's why she gets indicted. Um, now, it could be that that's accurate and it just wasn't included in the version of the transcript I was reading, but that was Lizzie's testimony. And there were a couple of times where the judge jumps in so, you know, maybe it, maybe it is real, but I haven't found it. Um, but I actually found that fascinating because, yeah, do we think if Lizzie Borden was a man and all the other facts were the same, even though it's all circumstantial, acquitted or guilty? Because I think that dude would have been hanging. I think a big part of it was we just can't see that a, that a good Christian woman of high born would do such a thing. Mm -hmm. Yes, Dana, it does kind of give you Amber Heard vibes. <laughs> um, yes, Nightwood, I mentioned Lizzie's lawyer gave Bridget money after the acquittal, which is definitely suspicious. So then we go to, oh, Lizzie's in jail. Um, Again, they really hone in on this Emma being the mother figure. I, I think this is part to try to keep the audience wondering and also humanizing her a little. They have this exchange about why does everybody hate me? Um, and then we go to a fashion show because why not? Um, I have not found anything regarding this, so maybe it's true, but I doubt it. Um, if I do, I'll correct that point. But yeah, basically she's, you know, she's got a whole setup in her, in her jail cell. And then she's more focused on what she's going to wear and how she's going to look and all of that. And now that could be accurate. Um, in her, in her life after the acquittal, she definitely focuses a lot more on being part of high society and, um, 
you know, this is going to play into that. So I, I think it's a, a little more, bit of artistic license trying to, again, bring the myths of what her character was into the story. So here they're implying that, you know, oh, she's just more more interested in how she's going to look and how she's going to be perceived than um, the facts of the case, right? And, you know, honestly, there's some other things that very get very suspicious about that. So, but who knows, you know, whether that's accurate or not. But what is, is, uh, so in the film, oh, I think they refer to it as a different magazine or a different outlet. But there's this scene where she's allegedly giving an interview to a reporter, and it turns out she did. Um, but it's the New York Recorder. And um, this, I haven't read the whole thing, but they do have, you know, direct quotes here. And um, if you want to read it, it's on that website, uh, lizzieandrewborden.com, under the press. Um, it really does. It really does read just like any other like PR spin, you know, like uh, let's let's get the public on her side. Let's show her as a as a kind, compassionate person. Um, I'm not sure whose choice it was to do it. Maybe it was hers. Maybe it was her lawyers. Um, he definitely uses that. Uh, it, he, you know, uses that, that, oh, she's she's a good Christian girl. And how could a woman like this do something so horrendous? He uses that a lot in the trial. So I could see this being tactic, but it, it does kind of make you look like, hey, you want some attention here, you know? Ah, let me do an interview <laughs> with a magazine, as you do. <laughs> so it's real. Uh, I think they used a different name for the magazine in the movie, maybe legal reasons. <laughs> now, this is, uh, this gets interesting. So they do a lot more of this like shoehorning in things that are allegedly true, you know, rumors and gossip of that time with these like flashbacks. So one of the things that I did hear from a couple of sources, like uh, historians, and then um, I'm not sure that I've read it in anybody's testimony yet, but uh, there are some like, it's the witness statements actually. So if you, if you look at the documents, you'll see witness statements, and that's mostly the investigators gathering information, but allegedly Lizzie Borden liked to steal things for funsies, apparently. Um, and apparently it was it was such a common thing that her father was just like, you know, if if anything disappears from your shop, if you think Lizzie takes anything, just put it on my tab. Now, that, that could be two different things. I mean, it could be that, you know, this this woman wanted a thrill, right? Let me just take this. It could also represent that she just has a an, an, a level of entitlement that, you know, oh. I want this, I need this, I'm gonna take this. And she also may have used that because her father was allegedly pretty stingy. So if he's kind of a cheap bastard and she's like, hmm, I think I want this pair of gloves, but my daddy doesn't like spending money on such frivolous things. So I'm just gonna take them and then they're just gonna put it on his tab and he's gonna have to pay for it anyways. <laughs> so I could see that being like, both things. Um, I have yet to see if it's been confirmed. I haven't read everybody's, like I said, I haven't gotten through all the trial testimony. I'm still working on it, but I would, wouldn't be surprised if maybe there were some store people that said, eh, yeah, you know, she would just take things. Um, now this is interesting because so as you can see, she is holding a hatchet because it wasn't an ax. Um, Basically, the differences between a hatchet and an axe are the handle. An axe is designed for chopping wood, so it has the long handle, and the uh, the head of it is going to be wider. So she's holding a nice shiny new one. This is mine. And no, that's not actual blood. Of course not. It's paint. Um, 
but there's a lot of mystery still surrounding this weapon because it was never actually found. <laughs> However, I just like to state as a petite woman, these are not that hard to swing. I, I don't know why people going with, keep going with, but a little bitty woman who's never swung an axe in her life couldn't dare. They're designed for it. It literally, if you hold it in your hand, it's going down. Um, you really don't need that much muscle. You really don't. They're designed to do a lot of damage with just a little wacky whack. And uh, again, you know, Mama Borden, or Stepmama Borden. By the way, if this falls down in the middle of my stream, I'll probably scream like it's a ghost. But Mama Borden got whacked, not 40 times, 18. So the little, the little song, our little, little child song is not accurate. That's right out the gate. But 18 times still kind of implies a, a lot of intent. <laughs> and there's a, a hit to the head, a hit to the back, and multiple hits to the skull. So it wasn't exactly as perfect as some people wanted to claim that it was. Again, it's not that hard to just start swinging and hit your target. But in this film, they take the approach that Lizzie steals the axe. Okay. Um, artistic license. We'll just go with it. Um, and then they cut to this other scene where she is getting in an argument with her family about this stealing. So they really want to ram it home. In this scene, her father's accusing her of stealing something from him. And, you know, she's like, well, I didn't. But even if I did, like, you're such a, you know, greedy, you know, stingy man that I, I deserve it. So they're using that, again, that, that implication that she wanted a better life. She wanted fancier clothes. She wanted a bigger house. She wanted more modern things that she was feeling rather, rather stifled in this situation. So they're just kind of really taking that home here with this whole, like, I, if I steal things, I deserve it, which goes to that entitlement. So yeah. Now, here comes the dress in the trial. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, allegedly, this is the dress that Lizzie gave them that she was supposedly wearing when everyone showed up. Huh. But was she? Because as you can probably imagine, most people can't describe the dress. So this is the doctor testifying and he pulls up, oh, I don't know. It was drab. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. What I find most suspicious, and this is why the dress is just going to end up with this whole episode. Uh, Bridget the maid pulls up. I can't recall. I do not recall. I swear I don't recall. <laughs> What was Lizzie wearing that? I don't know. Um, really, Bridget? Really? And what's fascinating about that is in the trial, they ask you what 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 was Lizzie wearing on Wednesday? And I I, I think this might have been a whoopsie backfire moment because they probably expected her not to be able to describe what Lizzie Borden wore on Wednesday. She does. She describes it in great fucking detail. Two different outfits. And one of them sounds a whole lot like the one Lizzie claims she was wearing this morning. So you can remember what she was wearing on Wednesday. But mm, when it comes to Thursday, you know, when people died, uh, I just I can't I can't recall. I can't recall. I can't recall. But everyone can recall the pink wrapper that she changes into. Before the police arrive, after the police arrive, does anyone know when? Lizzie says it was suggested that she should change her clothes. No other person wants to take responsibility for that one. 
Bridget says, no, I didn't suggest that. Alice Russell says, no, I didn't suggest that. Mrs. Churchill says, no, I didn't suggest that. <laughs> I don't know anything about it. Not suspicious at all. So the doctor's like, no, I'm not going to say it's that dress for certain. But allegedly, this dress was sent off for some forensics. This is where it gets really interesting because... There was blood on the dress. Not a lot, but some. They determined it was menstrual blood. But it's never like explained how they determined that other than that's what the doctor said it was because that's what Lizzie said it was. They didn't have the capacity to tell the difference between woman's menstrual blood and like, you know, her father's blood from being bludgeoned to death. So questions. And <laughs> there's an interesting little uh, notation by one of the detectives that uh, I don't think I have it on here. This is why the dress needs its own episode because he inquires about the dress or whatever. And then this bloody pale situation and these rags and the doctor is just like, don't you worry about it, sir. <laughs> she explained it to me and it's fine. Okay. All right. Okay. And the detective is just like, okay, that's what the doctor said. Cool. I'm like, okay. Okay. So apparently back in 1892, even police officers were like, I'm not going to talk about periods. And even the doctor is like, I'm not going to talk about it to you, sir. Good day. Good day. We just don't discuss these things. Now there's a question of, um, you know, whether it was even confirmed that she was or they just took her word for it because like apparently even doctors wouldn't necessarily examine for such a thing. Like this is too, ooh, ooh, no, no. And this is again where Bridget the maid seems to throw Lizzie under the fucking house or cellar um, because there's testimony about this bloody pail, you know, which is a pail with like, rags in it, the, the bloody rags, and it being found in the cellar. Lizzie says, I think it was there three or four days. And Bridget's like, nah, girl, I did the laundry. Like, no, if it was there yesterday, I would have cleaned it and taken care of it. So, uh, Really interesting when you consider the uh, police officer who says at about 11 o'clock at night, the night of the murders, Lizzie and Alice Russell were allegedly going down into the cellar and washing something in the sink. What? Why you got a lot of bloody things sticking around? I'm just saying, just saying. So... Could it be that this, I, I said it before, I was like, that that seems like a real convenient uh, thing to say, right? Oh, don't mind that thing full of bloody rags. It has nothing to do with the murders. <laughs> totally doesn't. Totally doesn't. Totally doesn't. And allegedly, well, actually, I guess this is confirmed. Even to this day, if they do the uh, luminal testing in the Borden house, in the cellar, there's blood splatter around the sink, like a lot of it. And apparently the blood from where Mr. Borden died actually like seeped through the floor. It's on the wall, which is just gross. So, I mean, granted, you know, if that's where they're cleaning up other things. That's probably why, you know, you, oh, well, that could be the explanation. But I just thought, huh. So we're just going to go with the blood on the dress is menstrual blood, even though you have no way of proving that. You literally just took everybody's word for it. You took her word for it, really. You just took her word for it. 
cool. That doesn't seem suspicious at all. Woo. Oh, yes, yes, uh, it is. There is a reference. Lizzie calls it a flea bite, which is the euphemism of the time for menstrual blood. Um, again, though, we don't know how much, but apparently it was not on the, again, it was not on the, uh, it was not on a slip. It was not on a petticoat. It was on the skirt itself. So, well, uh, ladies know that's not impossible. It's just uh, more questions than answers because no photograph of this, not at all. What? And, you know, we're just going to say, oh, no, it was not. It was not human blood. Okay, Alice Russell, big. They call this the betrayal in the movie because she's the one that allegedly went back and told the investigators about the burning of the dress. So wasn't mentioned when she was initially, in, you know, spoken to. And then she goes back and she says, because they were asking about Lizzie's dresses, you know, are they all accounted for, et cetera. And Alice Russell initially said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they're all still there, whatever. And then she goes back and she says, look, okay, I forgot to mention this. Sunday, uh, you know, just a few days after the murder, yeah, we were just standing in the kitchen and Lizzie pulls out a dress and she burns it. What? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. What? She sure did. She sure did. Um, and they actually, the scene in the film, it's pretty accurate. It just seems to mesh together a few different conversations. Uh, so she said, uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. I think this isn't the part I need to stop. Okay. So it's here. Um, it was the worst thing that could be done. And, oh yes, she said that Monday morning. So in the film, they put multiple conversations together when, uh, it sounds like it happened over a couple of days. So Sunday, the dress gets burned. And then um, there's this conversation about, oh, that was a, that was a bad idea. <laughs> um, and then she, this is where she says, yes, I confess that I, I had not mentioned the burning of the dress. That was the worst thing Lizzie could have done. And my sister said to her, why didn't you tell me? Why did you let me do it? So they actually have that almost word for word. Lizzie saying to uh, Emma, Oh, I'm sorry. This is actually, maybe it's Emma's. I thought it was Russell's testimony, but either way, they admit that, that, you know, she did this. They had this conversation. They didn't realize, oh, it was a huge mistake. We shouldn't have let her burn this dress. And this is where, once again, another dress and a whole lot of conversation about this fucking dress. I mean, they really go crazy here. This is a blue cord dress. It's a totally different thing. But they're very, very firm on, you know, what this dress is. So, you know, they do have this scene here. It's pretty accurate. She burns a dress. Um, so then Lizzie's defense brings in the dressmaker. We'll fix this. We'll fix this. Brings in the dressmaker to tell the story that sounds a little too convenient. Sounds a little too convenient. The dressmaker says, oh, yeah, you know, I made her these dresses back in May. It's now August. Well, from the murder. The trial happens much later. But And this is where it gets really odd because Lizzie says, oh, I put on the dress and they were painting the house and I immediately got paint on it. So it was ruined. Paint on the skirt. The dressmaker also says, oh, yeah, she put on the dress. It was just finished and she wanted to go show her family or her sister or somebody and she got paint on this dress. So it was immediately ruined. 
Emma, however, is like, oh, I think it happened a few weeks after. Like she wore it a few times and then she got paint on it. Oops. Um, but some said that was white paint. Some said it was brown, so it could look like blood. So, like there's, again, though, who, who are we taking the word of here? Who saw it? <laughs> the people who watched it get burned. Oops. And um, I found this fascinating breakdown the other day that actually seems to be going in the same direction I'm going because I thought that's a really odd thing to claim. Sure, you got paint on it. Maybe you can't wear it out. It wasn't a fancy dress. It was supposed to be a house dress. Um, material, it, it was expensive, you know. And even if you got paint on the skirt, you wouldn't just burn the whole dress. You would either try to refashion it or tear up the material and use it as you know, rags around the house, et cetera, which the dressmaker is asked about, but, oh, she says, oh, there, there, you couldn't have repurposed it. You couldn't have, you couldn't have done anything different with it. I'm like, but you said the paint was only on the skirt. So, mm. um, my thing is though, again, this goes back to kind of what Emma said that Lizzie did keep the dress and wear it around the house for quite some time to the point where it was starting to fade and look worn through and oh that's why she didn't keep it for rags because it was already a rag that's why she said oh i think you should burn it because it's already trash okay so she has this trashy dress that's already ruined that she has kept all this time all the way up until the Sunday after the murders. Okay. And it sounds like it is, uh, it, it, it's a, it's a very easy, like very light cotton morning dress that is also blue. There's some, there's some that say it was a light blue, but not quite baby blue or sky blue. And then there, you know, but navy blue, but oh, maybe it had some checkered designs. This is why the dress is going to get its own episode. Okay, so my thing is, okay, if you have two dresses that are blue and none of the men are actually paying attention to what she's wearing, she could have very easily gave the police a totally different dress. <laughs> Obviously. And kept the one that she was actually wearing when she bludgeoned someone to death. But there's more to that theory. Moving on, though. So the dressmaker tries to back her up and say, oh, yeah, she had this dress. It was ruined. That's why she burned it. Sure. Okay. Um, now we've got more. I don't even know what this shot is. One of the doctors testifying? I don't know. Wasn't important enough for me to remember. Okay, so now we have more artistic license because we do a scene where we have stepmommy and daddy in bed talking about her ab about the will, this mysterious will. The mother is suspicious that the daughters are trying to cut her out and she wants him to make a new will. And he's like, okay, fine, I will. And they have, they imply that Lizzie and Emma overhear this conversation. Okay, so we're getting into motive, right? Okay, so we have to make it about this. Again, I'm not always sure why we need a motive for a crazy person to just like snap and like hatchet someone to death, but you know, okay. There was questions. Um, I did find it interesting that according to the law, when the stepmother died, everything that was hers, went to her husband. So it wasn't until he died <laughs> that it would all go to the girls. So she had to die first. I suppose if you consulted somebody about that, you would maybe have that in the back of your mind. But in this particular scene, I think I wrote it down because they like, they really made it obvious here. Um, Lizzie says, 
I'll see her dead first. He must never make a new will. So they really want to go with this as her motive. Um, and then Emma conveniently is like, you know what? I think I'm going to get out of town for two weeks. <laughs> so this is, this is Hollywood really trying to cram it into one small scene. Um, there's no evidence this conversation occurred. There's no evidence they heard it. There's no evidence of this at all. So this is just Hollywood fiction. Um, back to the trial. Okay. Lizzie did faint. That is a thing that happened. Uh, she was not on the stand. This is when they pull out her father's skull. There's actually some artistic drawings from the courtroom, which are pretty funny to look at, of this moment where she's, oh. um, you know, could be a genuine reaction, could be, uh, could be some drama for attention, for, again, if she cares what people are thinking, well, let me let me faint. Oh, it's too much. It's too much. Weirdly, you didn't faint when you saw the body laying there, though. Like you open the door and you see your father's head bashed in and you don't faint then. But you see a skull. And you're like, I can't. OK. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Um, Emma takes the stand. They do seem to pull pretty, pretty much from her testimony. Again, kind of chopping it up and chopping it together. Um, they, they talk a lot about the dresses. They ask about, you know, was there any, any issues in the family? No, everything was great. Everyone got along, blah, 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 blah. There are lots of people in the witness statements. They're all very cagey and that's of the time, you know, we don't gossip, we don't talk about these things, but alleged, allegedly Lizzie was talking about it to some people, even her dressmaker. And if you're going to gossip, I mean, and she was saying that she thought her stepmother was deceitful and two-faced and um, they were very upset about this property thing where the father bought a piece of property and gave it to the stepmom's sister and they were like, well, we should get our own property. And then he did give them property. So, you know, there were some issues. There were some issues. Maybe they're blown out of proportion. Maybe not. If Lizzie's going around telling everybody um, all this crazy shit, then there's that. Oh, I almost forgot about Alice Russell also being the one who comes in and says, the night before the murders, Lizzie came over to my house and she starts saying all this crazy shit. She's kind of paranoid. She thinks people are poisoning them. She says uh, someone's going to break in and kill us in the middle of the night or burn the house down on us. And out of nowhere tells Alice Russell, oh, you know, the house has been burglarized. Yeah, somebody broke in in broad daylight while, while I and Emma and Bridget were there and stole some stuff. And the barn was broken into a couple of times. But there's really nothing in the barn anymore. So... Hmm. Maybe Lizzie truly was paranoid or maybe she needed to set the stage. She also knew at this point that I believe her uncle John was in town. So she knew that. So weirdly, she wasn't pointing the finger directly at him. This mysterious man who shows up the night before, but is very paranoid, is very paranoid. She is laying the groundwork for someone breaking in the house and murdering two people in the middle of the day. When the, the burglary happened like a year ago or something like that, six months ago. So it's like, um, not sure why it took you that long to become paranoid. I mean, okay. And then you just wander out to the barn by yourself. Okay, I'm not sure I'm gonna buy that you're that paranoid. But Emma does back up these these stories about the burglaries and all of that. Says, yes, this happened. But again, it wasn't recent. Not even close. So seems like a conven convenient tale to be telling your best friend. Then they have this completely, I have to say, fictional scene because I have not heard anyone testify to this. <laughs> but this is how we get the axe in. It also ap appears to be some other kind of motive they're trying to shove in. 
where uh, it goes to the barn was broken into and allegedly some of the pigeons were killed or something. So in this scene, her father goes into the barn and just kills the rest of the pigeons to keep someone from breaking in to kill the other pigeons. I don't know. But this is where he takes the hatchet. So we got the bloody hatchet. You know, like they're just trying to imply this is some sort of inspiration, I guess. <laughs> this is why she bludgeoned him to death with a hatchet because he killed her birds. I'm gonna go with this is just some made up shit, but if I, if I stumble on a testimony that backs it up, <laughs> other than the barn was broken into once, twice, some time ago. Maybe pigeons died. I don't know. Um, Bridget, however, testified that there were no animals in the barn, that they had a horse when she first started working for them like two and a half years ago. But the horse has been gone for a while, that there was nothing kept in the barn, no animals. So I'm not sure where the hell the pigeons come from. Maybe they weren't really pets. Maybe they were just, you know, roosting up there. Then it gets really creepy. So the other uh, alleged allegations, myths, things that could be motive. And this this one is uh, heavily leaned on in the film with uh, Kirsten Stewart. I think that one's just called Lizzie. I'll do it if people want me to do it. Um, don't really want to watch it again. It wasn't very pleasant the first time. Um, this gets weird. So this is the scene because Emma testifies about this ring that her father wore that he was still wearing at the time of his death that Lizzie gave him. So it, it, it's, 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 it's demonstrated in a flashback, right? So she's a child and she's giving her father this ring. And it's at first you, it's like, oh, okay. So she just really loves her papa. But then it goes a little to the, um, <clears throat> I don't know incest road it's the only way to and i probably just got kicked off youtube <laughs> can i say that word it's creepy it's creepy and then lizzie's mind is like flashing back and forth between this moment and the time where she like sneaks down in the middle of the night and kisses her father's dead body so again, I, uh, Hollywood here trying to shove every possible motive into the same film. Um, honestly, other than like some gossip, I don't think there's anything to support this. It's certainly the darkest motive. And this feels like Hollywood to me. This feels like, you know what? We need to make an excuse for this woman perhaps bludgeoning two people to death. So let's go with this. Cause you know, then everyone will forgive her for hatching him in the head 10 times. Right. <laughs> he was doing inappropriate things with her, but they're also implying she was like into it. So there's that. I don't know if that goes with Lizzie was an odd person. Me? Um, yeah, let's just throw in everything. Let's just throw in everything, Hollywood. Throw in the kitchen sink next. Oh, you did. <laughs> that was actually not anticipated. So now they don't show everybody who testifies by all means. This film cuts out a lot for obvious reasons. Um, we're not going to give you any other suspects. We're not going to give you any other clues. Uh, I don't even recall them. I don't recall them bringing in the poison. The guys who said they saw her come in to buy poison the day before. I don't think this film brought that in either. Um, which is interesting because that is historically accurate. And the, the men who say that, you know, she came in, actually did identify her as the person. So the testimony is accurate, whether or not it really happened. Yeah. But so now we're down to, if she'd have done it, this is how she did it. 
So again, Lizzie doesn't take the stand. Uh, how this film does it, how they cut it together is just, they they like, okay, this is the end of the trial. They tell her to stand. The judges like stand up. The jury's come back, you know, and uh, while she's standing there, this is like a flashback showing, I I'm implying this is her memory of what happened. So <laughs> she's standing there about to find out whether they think she's guilty or not. And basically the movie is like, she's totes guilty and here's how she did it. <laughs> yes, this is in 75, 1975. Yeah, I, there was a few things in there. I was like, wow. Uh, but yeah, going with the whole incest thing was definitely one I wasn't ready for. There is also another scene, I guess I didn't get the screenshot of it, where, because <laughs> her father did start out as a mortician, but I'm not sure that he was an actual mortician or he just owned like a, a funeral parlor or something. But in this scene, they have him with a dead body and he forces her to like touch it. And she like freaks out. And then like the thing comes out and blood sprays all over her. And she's just a child and she's like freaking out. And again, let's just throw every possible motive that we can into this like, tiny little flashback sequence um again i think that's just purely fiction don't know where they got that from i, I did i have not seen anything that indicates she she was ever anywhere near a funeral parlor or anything like that um so this is how the legend of lizzie borden says lizzie borden did it as you do so uh First thing is there was some running water in the house. This is this is something that people, I've seen people say there wasn't. And then the, people are like, but there was. And then, yeah, there actually was. Um, now they didn't have bathrooms upstairs. They didn't have all of that. But in the kitchen sink, there was a pump. Uh, apparently in the basement or the cellar, there was another hand pump. And then the barn also had a hand pump. So this is like a pump coming from the well. Um, so in this one, they have her going into the kitchen, filling up a pitcher. Now I will say, I don't think that's going to be enough to do the job, but carry on. And, uh, she then makes her way through the house. She closes, she makes sure the doors are locked, even though the doors were allegedly locked, everything but the back door. The screen door may have been open because Bridget was still outside washing windows allegedly she was outside washing windows at some point we just don't know was she out there when all the murders happened or when some of the murders happened or what we don't know so then she comes upstairs there's her stepmom making the bed she sees bridget still outside talking to the neighbor's maid and we're gonna go with the very hollywood very very edgy but became a very popular myth. And apparently it is suggested in the trial. Lizzie strips naked. Dun, dun, dun. And this is how they're going to have her commit the murders. She hid the hatchet that she stole under her mattress, as you do. <laughs> I mean, I might sleep with mine next to my bed, but that's a different story. She then goes across the hall. Hello, dear stepmama. Now, I actually like the idea that stepmom was making the bed when she was approached because of the way the body lays. Um, you know, she ends up rather close to that wall, but she doesn't hit the wall. And she's face down. And granted, they did move the body before the photograph was taken, but the, the legs look buckled, the knees look buckled. It looks like maybe she was on her knees when she got hit and then fell. So I actually like this idea. Plus it works with the story because everybody says that Uncle John stayed in this bedroom. And according to Maggie, the maid, she didn't take care of that bedroom. That Mrs. Borden would typically take care of that bedroom. So after breakfast, when Mrs. Borden says, you know, I'm, I'm, she's dusting, 
she, first she's dusting around the house and she tells Maggie to go wash the windows. Lizzie says she sees her mother go up the stairs with some pillow shams. She assumes she's going into the guest room. In her inquest, she's asked, well, well, why would she take more than three minutes to do that? You know, just, that's a very short task. Oh, I don't know. Well, could she have been doing anything else up there? Oh, I don't know. Um, unless she was sewing. Well, did you hear the sewing machine? No. For some reason, Lizzie Borden absolutely will not say the very simple, like, because I would assume, oh, maybe she was making the bed and cleaning it up and dusting and all of that. Makes sense. After breakfast, after dusting around the dining room and the sitting room, she went upstairs to the guest room to remake the bed, clean everything up, dust away, you know, get it prepared again for uh, Uncle John wasn't supposed to come back, but, you know, it's her guest room. She's going to get it prepared in case another guest shows up. So it's weird that Lizzie is like trying to avoid saying that she was making the bed. I'm like, that's odd because it actually makes sense to me that she probably went up there and was doing the whole thing and making the bed and was in a position very close to this. I don't think she necessarily turned and looked, but maybe. If she did though, if she did see the person approaching her from behind and did not scream, then she knew her attacker. So, bludgeoned to death next to the bed. Oh, oh, this shot, they've got more blood spatter. <laughs> That's interesting. It wasn't there in the first one. Now, this is how they, uh, this is how they say she cleaned up. So she goes back to her room. Again, she's got her little basin here. And she takes her pail of water and she just, you know, bird baths it. <laughs> but once again, we didn't put a cap on her head. I don't know why nobody's putting a goddamn cap on her head. It would make the most sense. Um, she cleans up. She then takes her little pail down to the cellar and dumps the bloody water in the privy. But remember, the police said there was a pail of bloody water and rags just chilling. Bum, bum, bum. It was just sitting down there. And Bridget and Lizzie have different ideas of how long it was sitting down there. And there is testimony about another, uh, more like a hand basin that had blood in it and bloody towels that everyone just assumes was from the doctors who come in and touch the body and they wash their hands because they did wash their hands. <laughs> the way they just contaminate the shit out of this crime scene is hysterical. <laughs> but I guess that's 1892 for you. I'm just like, oh my gosh. Uh, uh, I, I mean, I only watch CSI, but I'm like, what the fuck? It goes back to the bloody footprints that never are mentioned. Nobody mentions any kind of bloody footprints. There was carpet, but there was also wood. If it had been an intruder, wouldn't there have been footprints? But maybe they don't care because by the time the police show up, like seven people have walked through the goddamn crime scene. You know, you've got you got Lizzie, you got the maid, you got um, Alice Russell, you've got Mrs. Churchill, you got Dr. Bowen. That's a lot of people walking through a crime scene. And then you got Uncle John. There's some debate when he showed up and how many police officers were already there and how many weren't. Then there's another doctor. So how many people were just tramp tromping around? And, you know, by then, maybe, maybe there's so many blood footprints and marks and things that, you know, we can't even begin to determine whether or not one of these was from the murderer. So you know, that could be it. But also, again, if the maid is outside washing the windows, going back and forth to the barn, Lizzie's the only one inside. And she kills her stepmom. Let's just say she did it. The movie says she did. So she kills her stepmom. She goes down to the cellar. Again, there's another wash bin down here. She could have also taken her bloody rags 
And, you know, if there was any dro drops of blood or footprints on any of the hardwood, she's got time. She's got tons of time right here. There's, they estimate probably an hour between the deaths. So we're talking like 9.30 to maybe 10.30. So she's got time. She got time to go to wipe down that, that staircase with her bloody rags and take it down to the cellar and then be like, job done. And uh, in this one, now this is weird because I don't know why they had her put the, the hatchet in her stocking. <laughs> But I'm like, you're carrying a pail of bloody water. Just dunk it in there and carry it that way. Anyway, but what I did find interesting about this shot, I don't know if it was intentional or if it was an accidental thing that actually happened when they were filming. Um, but they end up, there end up being a blood stain on the skirt. Like in the, it, and honestly, it could be in the right spot. So it may have been an intentional thing that they, they added you know, some fake blood to her skirt. Um, because again, this is allegedly the dress that she gives the police that does have some blood on it. Um, so in this, in, in this part, cause this is, this is murder one. She hides the hatchet in the, in with the other hatchets. She had cleaned it. Oh no, she didn't clean it in the sink. Not sure where she cleaned this one. Hmm. But she just dunks it in with the other. She's just like, boop, you know, and then goes back upstairs and takes a nap. <laughs> because murder is exhausting. I need to have a lie down. I think that's hysterical. I, I like, I really think that's hysterical. Um, I see your questions. We'll get to questions. <laughs> and then. Like I said, I think I'm going to end up making a whole episode next week where we just go through the other suspects, the myths, the I'll give you my theory. You can throw out some fun ones. Um, everybody had them already. And I'm just like, wow. But the more I read, the more I'm like, shit, hmm, I don't know. Oh, but, you know, she has a lie down. It's a hot day. She just murdered someone. Weirdly, still wearing this dress, because this is what I keep saying. It's a hot day. It's a hot day. It's like 84 degrees. There's no AC back then. And she's in this house that's sweltering. Then she claims she goes out to the barn, which is going to be even hotter. There is no way this woman was wearing a, a dress like this. There's no way that she was wearing that inside the house again. The dress she describes is definitely a party dress or something you put on for nice dinner or you going out. It, it, it's not a house dress. And she had no intentions of going anywhere this day. So it is much more likely that she was either wearing this light blue wrap dress that's very, that's cotton, it's light, it's maybe it's the one with the paint, you know, and uh, she's just wearing it around the house. But I also think, you know, it's possible she when she went upstairs and she sees her stepmom doing whatever, maybe she makes a passing comment that, you know, uh, it's so hot and I'm feeling a little faint and I think I'm going to go have a lie down. And then she just goes in a room and instead of stripping naked, she just goes down to a shift. But I still think more and more she was actually just wearing this other blue dress and Therefore, she doesn't care about this dress. This dress is already ruined. So, you know, you get angry. You get angry. Where did she get the hatchet? Mm, I haven't figured that out yet. But she gets angry. Maybe they have words. This is the other thing. After, so Uncle John leaves first. Then father. Then, you know, Mr. Mr. Borden. So then it's the three ladies in the house. Mama Borden sends the maid out to go wash the windows. We're not sure how long this takes her. She's not sure how long it takes her. So it's now just Lizzie and, and Mama Borden inside the house. Well, Mrs. Borden, I guess, because she's not Mama Borden. Mrs. Borden. So uh, Lizzie says, you know, I'm downstairs. I'm in the dining room. I, I, I'm ironing handkerchiefs. And apparently the, the iron and the handkerchiefs and the, all that really was on the table. So... 
Everybody says it was there. So she was doing this. But she says after Mrs. Borden goes upstairs with these pillow shams, she doesn't see her again. Convenient. That would mean that she was absolutely murdered way earlier than father. Because if she wasn't murdered as soon as she went up there, or shortly after, then she would have come back down. She would have been kicking around the house again. She would have, you know, they would have seen each other. But we don't know because we only have Lizzie's word for what exchange could have possibly happened between the two of them after the maid goes out to wash the windows. Could have been anything. Could have been something that made Lizzie so angry that she marches out the back door to the barn where the hatchet or whatever, or she goes down to the cellar where there's a hatchet or because there is a missing hatchet, allegedly. And she, you know, just because there is, she also does say she goes down to the cellar at some point. She first, she says, oh, I think it was when I first got up. And then that kind of changes. So you're down in the cellar where the hatchets are. Maybe you're angry. Maybe you come up and you're pissed. And you just 18 wax to the head. Now, is she covered in blood from head to toe? Mm. Unless somebody wants to recreate it, which I'm surprised they haven't. You'd think it would go slinging on your face and in your hair, but you never know. You never know. But this is where I say, if she's wearing this blue house dress that doesn't mean a goddamn thing to her, she's already ready to burn it. All she'd need to do is put a cap on her head, really. There's also some interesting points about how long the dress was, which makes people think the opposite thing. Apparently this, this blue one was a little longer than others. So that, that's gonna help cover everything. But some people are like, oh, how could she possibly straddle a body and swing a hatchet when wearing a skirt? Like, do I need to put on a skirt and film myself swinging a hatchet? Like, what do people think it requires? It's not, you, it's not a baseball bat. You don't have to like straddle anything. It's also, again, doesn't look like the body was straddled per se. I mean, I guess maybe, but I don't, I don't know how restrictive people think skirts actually are, especially in the 1890s. <laughs> like if it's a house coat, it's really, it's like easy breezy, no big deal. But back to the movie, Lizzie's having a lie down as you do. And then either there's a knock or a ring. There's dispute there. The maid says she just hears Mr. Borden trying to come in. And she's in the dining room doing the inside windows. So she goes to let Mr. Borden in. Now, this is what I said earlier about how in this version, this is what they show Lizzie laughing at the dead body. So she's looking through the staircase rather than laughing at Maggie. But again, Maggie didn't see her on the stairs. Maggie says she just heard her laugh. So it's also this house. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a house or a set. I think it's a, I think it's a mix of both. Um, the staircase, all of this isn't exactly the same. They did a pretty good job with the layout, but in the actual Borden house, it's much smaller and there is a uh, very little space between the, um, the end of the staircase and the door when it's open. Uh, there's a whole thing uh, where they ask the doctor like, well, it, it, if the door was open, you would have noticed, right? And he's like, yeah, because I, I wouldn't have been able to walk by it. So this is a little bit bigger and roomier. But I also think the staircase is very different. Um, the one in the actual house appears to be more curved. And so, yeah, there's you're really not going to see somebody standing at the top of it. Artistic license there. And uh, so, you know, once again, now this is Lizzie's version. She does still have 
well, actually, so she just comes in. Dear Papa is lying down. He's going to have a lie down now. <laughs> and there's this really sweet but also creepy exchange. Um, now, again, they have her after she sees him. Says, oh, why don't you have a lie down? Ah, no mail for me. No mail for me. Okay. Why don't you have a lie down, Papa? She goes down to the cellar this time because remember, that's where she left her murder weapon. So she goes down to the cellar this time. The maid is now allegedly going upstairs to have a nap in the attic in her room. So the maid is just poof. And Lizzie goes down to the basement. She takes her clothes off, grabs her hatchet, comes back up and murders dear papa. Now, here's my favorite part where Hollywood really does Hollywood like no one else could. <laughs> because in this in this version, like when she killed her stepmom, she had her hair back and, you know, what have you. This time, she not only gets naked, but she lets her hair down. <laughs> So as far as murder plans go, this ain't it. But as far as Hollywood goes, this is the money shot. <laughs> because we have we have to have Lizzie Borden naked with her hair down, sweating. This is a little sexy for a murder scene, if you ask me. Um, I, I this is just. This is just not plausible. She's not going to take her hair down to commit a murder. But, you know, she also probably didn't do it naked. And then, oh, we just bludgeon him to death. Now, see, this time, we're we're going to even splatter it in her hair and our face. And we're going for it. We're going for it. But here's where the problem comes in. They're having the clock strike 11 already. So they're saying the murder happens at 11 o'clock. Eh. That can't be true. Well, can't be true. Remember, the maid says, I hear the clock strike 11. I'm only up in my bedroom, she says, for three to four minutes. I, I lied down, but I, I didn't fall asleep. And then I hear the clock strike 11. And then I hear Lizzie call for me. So if Lizzie's just murdering him at 11 o'clock, then she called the maid down while she was still covered in blood and naked. So standing there with a hatchet, that didn't happen. But this goes back to the discrepancy between uh, uh, Bridget saying that, oh, I think he came home at 1040. Then that became 1055. And I think she changed it because she says she only went upstairs for a few minutes. So Bridget, for whatever reason, has to close her own window. But there's no way that the murder happened at like 1055 or 11 o'clock. And then because too many witnesses are like, oh, by 1115, the doctor, you know, is coming over. She's, you know, Mrs. Churchill is like, it, I think it was 11 o'clock when I saw her maybe a little after. So at the very latest, it's 1115 when other people are coming into the house. And it's true that Dr. Bowen, Bowden, Bowen says that the body still felt warm, that the blood was still kind of flowing. So he hadn't been dead very long. But I think it was probably between 1030 and 11, maybe closer to like 1045. That gives her enough time to maybe do some cleanup. But there's an interesting theory that I really like. So this time, after she's done with her murder, she flies into the kitchen, as you do. And uh, she tosses her bloody axe in the sink and rinses it off. And then she bird baths it, as you do, in the kitchen sink. <laughs> While the maid is just upstairs having a nap. Okay. Okay, but at least, you know, we got water. <laughs> um, and then she goes back to the cellar 
these these shots are unfortunately so dark that I'm like, eh. Uh, this time she dumps the hatchet, you can't even see that one, in the uh, privy and gets dressed again. And then she comes back upstairs and the end. All of that, by the way, is shown while Lizzie is waiting to find out whether she's guilty or not. So this is the, you're not guilty, you're acquitted, go home, the end. Um, so eh, as far as it goes, you know, it's still, there's still a lot of mystery, but I'll give them credit for getting a lot more accurate than I was expecting actually, <laughs> but there's still a lot of holes and a lot of artistic license there, but you know, it's still, there's still so many questions about, uh, who could have done it? How could how could they have done it? And if it was Lizzie, how could she have cleaned up and all of this? So, you know, they're just trying to put it together based on, granted, this is also what the state kind of tries to say, you know, well, we can't explain why none of her clothes were covered in blood. So she was naked. Which is a weird choice when you have her burning a dress. I would just say that was the dress she was wearing. But I guess they the problem they have there is that, you know, oh, well, we have two witnesses who are saying, oh, no, it just had paint on it. Well, three, if you count the dressmaker. But the dressmaker didn't see it the day it got burned. And in truth, I don't think Alice Russell or Emma Borden actually saw anything of the dress other than, a, you know, she takes out a dress, a thing, a blue thing, and shoves it in the fucking fire. So we only have their word for it that, oh, yeah, it was this this blue cord dress that had paint on it. Okay, but how do you know it didn't have blood on it? How do you know it wasn't covered in blood? Uh, uh, did you examine it closely? No. And then they acknowledge that after she burns it, like right after she burns it, they go, oh, that was probably a bad idea. <laughs> hmm. And again, I say, I don't think you're actually going to burn a whole dress in 1892 when you would definitely at least, you know, rip it up and use it as rags and things like that. Dusting rags that you would quilt with things like that make things around the house. You know, we only have Emma's word that it was so worn out, so worn out that it wouldn't even be good for, let's say, bloody rags. No, it was so, it was, it was a rag itself, which is interesting because again, the doctor is like, he doesn't want to say what he thought the dress was, but he's like, well, it was drab. It was a drab thing. It was all worn out. Okay, well, that would definitely imply the dress that got burned, not the one that the police got, which is significantly nicer dress. And then what really gets interesting, and this is why the dresses, it's a whole thing. I'm pretty sure I can solve it with the dresses, maybe. I don't know. Um, there's still the issue of the murder weapon, but someone, so Bridget actually is asked to describe what she was wearing that morning. And what she described she was wearing sounds an awful lot like this dress that everyone else is describing Lizzie was wearing that Lizzie also has. And maybe they both have a very similar dress, but this is interesting because in every version, in, in this one, I think in all the others, you have the maid wearing a typical like cliche maid uniform, the black dress with the white apron. That's not what she was wearing. Not at all. She's wearing a navy blue dress with um, a navy blue calico dress, which is like cotton dress that also has a pattern that sounds almost identical to the pattern that people were describing was on Lizzie's dress. And I'm like, hmm. Is it that the women either couldn't remember or don't want to remember what Lizzie was wearing? So they're describing Maggie's dress, Bridget's dress. 
this is why it's going to get its own thing because I'm still digging, basically. I'm on it. I'm going to figure out this dress thing. But one other theory, I'm going to throw this one at you today, but it'll probably come up in my other video when I, when I finally get to how, what, how do you think she did it? If she did it, did she do it? Yeah. Um, but I didn't put this one in the, uh, hold on. I got to pull it up first. I didn't put this one in this, the slideshow because I, I didn't want to do that to people. So you're going to get your warning, your graphic image warning incoming, incoming graphic image warning. This is one of the crime scene photos. <laughs> so if you're squeamish, look away. Um, now, this is actually, I found this when somebody colorized, which is cool, the photo of dear Papa. <laughs> because it was, this wasn't in the movie, was not in the movie, but I have questions. So I'm kind of borrowing this theory from somebody else, but we agree on the dress thing. So I, I need to, I need to reach out to this person. So here's, I'm, I'm, I'm going to zoom in. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But, oops, that's not what we want to do. Take your attention to this here, right here in the corner. This is allegedly Daddy Borden's coat. And it's said to be a very nice coat. Um, you know, like a, like a, like a, a suit coat or an overcoat, like a nice coat. Again, it was 84 degrees. As you can see, he's still wearing his suit coat. And apparently he kept this coat hanging, you know, in a closet. So why... Because the idea was they just they just brushed this aside as he took his coat off, rolled it up, and put it under his head as a pillow. Which would make sense if it wasn't 84 degrees outside. Why, why would you even have that coat? You wouldn't. There's no reason to have that coat out on this day. And if it's not hanging literally right there, which it wasn't typically... He's not going to go get his nice coat to roll up and use as a pillow when there's literally a pillow right here. And of course, sorry, it's pretty gross, but it's pretty pixelated. So whatever. Um, so this coat, this mysterious coat, which allegedly gets burned or buried with the bodies, one or the other. Um, some people are postulating, and I like this idea, that Lizzie, maybe for both murders, maybe not, because again, daddy wasn't supposed to be home. He wasn't supposed to be home. When he shows up and knocks on that door, she's not expecting him either. So, why was she laughing upstairs? Hmm. If she did, you know, that's just Bridget's testimony. But she's just, you know, ha, ha, ha. Uh-oh. Now what do I do? But if she sees her father's coat, which is definitely going to be big enough for her, Someone has suggested that she put the coat on backwards, potentially. It doesn't have to be backwards, but backwards works. Uh, hold on, I'm going to get a picture. There's another picture I want. I just have to figure out where I left it, as you do. Also getting a thousand text messages. I want the one of the... There it is. Oh, no, you can't see the... I was 
trying to get the one of the house with the couch. Couch! I want the couch! I need the couch. I have this one, but I want the other angle. This is what happens when you don't put it in the thing. Well, we'll use this one. So if you come in and you're wearing, I was trying to get the one that shows the door over here, but if you come in and you're wearing a coat, whether it's this way or backwards, and you hatch it, you're standing in the doorway, you're hatcheting him in the head because he's already asleep. So there's no reason. I One thing I don't like that they do in the movie is they have her announce herself to both victims. I'm like, that would be dumb. That would be dumb. You're not going to do that. You're going to walk up and either try to be stealthy or, you know, at least not let on that you are about to do something bad. So I don't think she said anything to him. I think she left him sleeping there or whoever it was. The murderer definitely did not wake him up before hitting him with that hatchet or whatever weapon. Because why would you? You, you have the perfect prey right now, an unconscious person. You wake up, you wake up a man, he could fight back. So, um, oh no, Lady Grey, you think I lost my monetization because I put that up there? Maybe I can blur it out. <laughs> uh, but if you just walk in the door and you're covered by a coat, the sofa is also kind of blocking the bottom part of your body. So you're not really going to get blood splatter there. And you just hit in the head, you know, so all that would be exposed potentially is her neck and head, her hands, and that's it. That's it. And if you've already figured this out because you did it once earlier and you made a big mess or something, yeah. you got smarter. And maybe this is when she puts a cap on. I'm just saying, all you got to do is put a goddamn cap on your head and you don't have to worry about anything. And then what do you do with a cap? Well, you take it off and you toss it in that pail of bloody rags. And then it just looks like another bloody rag. And then what does she have to do? take the coat off, roll it up, put it under the head or put it on the sofa next to the head. And there you go. You don't have to explain that. It looks like it was there when, when he gets bludgeoned to death. Therefore, of course it's covered in blood. Ta -da! I think that's an excellent theory. It sure beats random stranger coming in house. Weirdly knowing that mama, you know, Mrs. Borden is upstairs uh, cleaning the guest room and sneaking up behind her and bludgeoning her to death and then hanging out for about an hour until the maid goes upstairs to take a nap and Lizzie Borden goes out to the barn where she's totally eating pears standing next to a window but doesn't see anybody come or go. And then a stranger creeps out of the guest room and creeps downstairs and without even knowing that this man is sitting, is lying in the sitting room having a nap Sneaks up behind him and hatchets him to death? Nah. You wouldn't even know where he was. Unless you were Lizzie or Bridget. Those are the only two people that knew Mr. Borden was in the house, in that room, having a nap. Which, again, makes them the prime suspects. <laughs> And the fact that, uh, I, saw, I mentioned this earlier, I saw somebody else repeat it. Um, you know, the maid gets a chunk of money from Lizzie's lawyer to piss off back to Ireland after the trial. And like I said, she pissed off out of that house that night. She was like, I ain't sleeping here. I'm going next door to sleep with this other maid. Because, uh-uh. 
I can't stand here. She seemed pretty thoroughly freaked out. To the point where maybe, maybe she definitely knows what happened to that house. <laughs> oh, everybody loves the uncle. Yeah. Chubby is like, I don't know. I keep thinking the uncle's alibi is too perfect. Well, meh. I thought that too initially. But again, this is why I say what's fascinating about all the film takes so, that I've seen so far is that no one even mentions the uncle. Like he just doesn't exist. Maybe that's because, yeah, that it, it's a pretty good suspect because it is. And apparently uh, he was the initial suspect. So, so much so that the town thought he was the suspect and he tried to leave the house like the next day or something and got like a kind of, a, you know, hounded on the street and a, a police officer actually had to sort of rescue him and take him back to the house. So there were a lot of people that thought it was the uncle. I'm not saying it's not. I'm just saying. His alibi kind of did check out, so it sucks. Plus, you still have the issue of if it's him, where was he the entire day? No one saw him. Lizzie didn't see him. Unless you, you know, unless Lizzie's lying, and she absolutely did. <laughs> and it was just like, that's cool. Go ahead, murder away. Um, but the maid is like, oh no, he left in the morning. He would have had to come right back into the house, hide in the guest room for if he came back in the house and went up to the guest room and the only one in there at the time was Mrs. Borden, you know, okay, so he bludgeons her. Then what's he going to do? He, he's, he's got Lizzie downstairs kicking around. The father isn't supposed to be home, though he did invite them. Apparently, he was invited back for lunch, which is supper or dinner in that day, which was supposed to be around noon. So that's why he comes back. Now, that would imply that Mr. Borden intended to be home for supper, dinner, lunch. We'll just call it all the things. And... So, you know, if you were going to wait around for him to return at noon, but then you still have the problem of Lizzie and the maid who are still alive. Why? You're just going to risk like these two women walking around the house while you murder somebody and totally not worry about it. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they'd be dead. They'd be dead too. Which is why, you know, Lizzie's excuse is, oh, I was out in the barn. Okay. Now, Bridget appears to be the only person who saw Lizzie go to the barn. Again. That's maybe where the hatchet was. She definitely did not go up in the attic, it sounds like. She tries to say she went to the second level looking for things. But the police looked and looked and looked and they said, you know, there wasn't a single footprint up there in the dust except for ours. So that's the first mention we have of footprints. And I'm like, hey, OK, so you guys look for fo footprints. You did. You did. You said you did in the barn. You, you just forgot about the house. You just forgot about the bloody footprints in the house. OK, it's fine. Whatever. But yeah, I think that's very interesting that they're like up the stairs in the barn, um, there's no footprints. There's no dust disturbed. It's, they're, they're also like, there's really nothing up there. And again, even the maid is like, you know, there's no animals out there. There's no nothing. Yeah, she says she was eating pears. Is the new my dog stepped out of B. Yeah, kind of. It's a weird thing. Also, the pears. See, this is what happens when you actually read testimony. Not only do you find things that are, you know, hmm, that doesn't mesh, but you might come across a little thing that probably nobody is even thinking about at all. But maybe people should. 
Because, yeah, Lizzie says, I go out to the barn, I stop at the pear tree, I pick up some pears off the ground. This is after saying she didn't feel like eating anything in the morning. I then go into this dusty, hot barn, go up to the second level, and I stand there. First, she says the window was closed, and she says the window was open, and she's standing there, and she's eating three pears. Okay. However... In the morning, her father picked up a bunch of pears and put them in the dining room. So there are already pears, fresh pears, sitting in the dining room where she was multiple times. So if girl felt like having a pear, why don't you just eat the ones that are right there in the dining room? Why are you like, let me go outside and think about it and pick up my own and whatnot. But, you know, Uncle John also says something weird where he comes back and allegedly goes back in the back and gets a pear off the ground as well. And I'm like, I mean, I get it, but maybe he didn't know there were pears inside because that could have been after he left. But Lizzie was literally sitting in the dining room and ironing in the dining room and doing all this stuff. And there's a basket of pears. But she's not going to eat those pears. No, she's going to wait till later. <laughs> but she's on a mission to find a piece of iron. No, a lead sinker. No, iron to fix the screen door. No, what? Ah, hmm. Once again, she told people different things the day of. She told someone, allegedly, that she was looking for a piece of iron to fix the screen door. In her inquest, it becomes, I was looking for a lead sinker to go fishing on Monday. <laughs> ah. mm. Oh, I, you were going to suggest that one of the victims was in cahoots with the uncle, but if his alibi is that airtight. Which victim? And what benefit is it to him? Because that's the issue with the uncle. It does not benefit him in any way to kill either of them. Well, unless you go with his business dealings with the dad were not going well. But there's not really a lot to back that up. Um, in fact, he had a letter. He presented a letter because um, Mr. Borden had actually asked for his advice on buying a building. And he sent him a letter and said, oh, you know, I, I took your advice. I did this. And then there was something he wanted to talk about in person, which, you know, maybe it was business that went bad. But that would imply that he only intended to kill Mr. Borden, not Mrs. Borden. And she was dead first, unless you want to go with all of that is wrong and that she was just kicking around the house all morning. Nobody saw her and she dies after. But his body was still fresh. Eh, hers, not so much. So. Ooh, Lori Hall. If he was involved in the murders and did them, he and Emma could have framed Lizzie. I don't see any evidence of anybody framing Lizzie, though. Quite the opposite. Everything implies that people are trying to protect Lizzie. Everything. This goes back to the ladies and the dresses. There is a lot of issues with dresses. A lot. And, you know... I can, I can give a pass to some of the men, especially like police officers, not being able to describe a dress other than to say, I don't know, it was dark blue. Like I can give a pass to that. But all these women, and the thing is they will describe a dress in great detail. But when it comes to the dress that Lizzie was wearing that morning, everybody seems to go, oh, I'm sorry, I don't recall. Can't remember, can't describe it. Don't know, don't know. Just don't know. I don't know. It's a mystery. You know, everything else about that day is etched in my brain forever. But what she was wearing, not so much. 
which actually like makes me wonder if maybe there was more blood on Lizzie Borden's dress than people want to admit. Maybe she tried to give a like rational excuse and they were like, that sounds plausible. Let's protect her. That's a theory. Maybe she said, when they got there, I went in and I, I, I tried to touch him. I tried to, I tried to, I tried to wake him. I, I, I panicked and maybe she's covered in blood. <laughs> and they're just like, oh no, you poor thing. Let's get you cleaned up. Oh no, the police have arrived. Shit. Uh. Because again, who is going to suspect her? No one. No one. So that works in her favor if, you know, her friend shows up and her neighbor shows up and the doctor shows up and the doctor does also do some maybe sketchy things. So, hmm. You guys are going with the freaking affairs again. <laughs> that didn't happen, though. Um, she did go visit friends, though. She did. She did. I mean, yeah, her absence, you could consider that a sign of something. But... I, do I think that uh, somebody knows who did it? Yeah, I think I think Emma, Lizzie, and Bridget know who did it. That's my guess. Or they have a very strong feeling about who did it. Very strong feeling. So let's talk. Let's talk a little bit about the aftermath, and then that's probably where I'm going to leave this one. So my next one Thursday probably won't be. I'll probably have more time to go into more crazy shit because I'm going to do the modern, more modern version. The, uh, the version with, um, Christina Ricci, which I have seen before, but I, it's been a minute. So one of these days I'm going to get this, I'm going to get this screen sharing thing. So we're going to do Thursday. We're going to break down Lizzie Borden took an ax. And I already know <laughs> there is going to be all kinds of crazy shit in that one. Um, they still go with the she did it. She she gets naked, all that jazz. But um, I'm trying to recall if they actually do try to implicate anyone else in the crime. Um, that could be the only difference. We'll see. But uh, so Thursday, we're going to do that one. And then, because I just I just keep finding new things and going, ooh, and it's so much that it might need, we might need one episode of just like pure speculation where I'll tell you my theory when I'm finished making it. <laughs> and then everybody else can really go crazy with the speculation. Um, because again, this, th th this dress thing is like, what the? And you know, of course, Guys aren't, guys aren't doing this. They don't care. They don't know. They all think that it took her 40 minutes to get dressed and that she needs, you know, an assistant to cinch her into a corset. And I'm like, ha, she says, she's here, says here she's wearing a house coat. She's wearing a wrapper. Them are very different things. So, uh, but I do, yeah, I also like, I like Christina Ricci. Um, she, d she does do creepy well. And there is a series, a spinoff series um, that follows her life after the murders, which is a whole thing. But and may maybe we could do that because there are some things that come into play. So one of the things that I heard that made my jaw kind of drop, <laughs> in addition to the maid allegedly getting a good chunk of money to fuck off to Ireland... She did return to the U.S., though, at some point, but she never went back to employment with the Bordens, okay? But she gets a chunk of money and vanishes to Ireland. When the trial was over, this this is crazy. This is maddening. This is like, what the fuckery? Um, the state wasn't interested in pr prosecuting anyone else, apparently. I guess they'd hate to admit they were wrong. <laughs> 
So they were just like, fuck it. Um, and they released all the evidence to Lizzie Borden. Imagine that. Imagine releasing all the evidence to your prime suspect. <laughs> the fucking fuck okay that sounds brilliant but here's what's weird lizzie allegedly said because her lawyer was like what do you want to do with it and she allegedly said i don't care you don't care eh you don't care you don't care you were accused of murdering your father and your stepmother in the most brutal fashion. You said you didn't do it. There was a trial. Now, I can understand that the trial was hell and you just maybe want to move on with your life. But the only chance in hell you'd ever have of clearing your name is the evidence. Most likely, right? And if you... And also just let's let's pretend she was a devoted daughter who loved her father you're gonna tell me that you're not gonna use all that evidence and hire like a private investigator and and spend the rest of your life trying to solve this mystery yourself because i would i become the world's greatest detective it's not like she had anything else to do she's a rich chick in 18 whatever so this is something um, that, uh, let me see if I can find it. Um, they said it on, uh, it was on, um, bum, bum. I was hoping I could find it to, to quote it directly because uh, Rob said it on his t uh, stream, and I had never heard this before. Um, but it was either after she died, I think it was right after she died, there was a statement that she released. I can't find it now. <laughs> I, just saw, I just saw a version of the photo, like I guess what I should have done is blurred out his face. <laughs> but there's the jacket, there's the coat. Um, bum, bum, bum. I just found some interesting article. I'll read that later. But apparently Lizzie made a statement, something like, you know, I would have given all the money in the world um, to clear my name and prove that I didn't kill my father. And I think it was after her death they released this statement. Maybe it was after the trial, but either way, if that's your statement, but then here's all the evidence and you're like, I don't care. I don't care. I don't care what you do with it. I don't care. Okay. Mm okay. Okay. That seems suspicious. Seems like, you know, who did it and that's why you don't care. Right. Cause that, didn't care i still care and it wasn't even my dad i'm over here like well that's not him i forgot he's not on the wall um i'm just gonna have 14 things up here by the time we get to thursday i'm gonna have a murder wall a full-on murder wall i'm gonna put string um so her lawyer apparently is the one who had some foresight and put some of the evidence in safekeeping. So that's how like the historical society in Massachusetts and River Falls, like that's how they have some of this stuff because the lawyer kept it. Which brings me back to where is the goddamn dress? It was in evidence. Where is it now? Did it get burned too? I bet it got burned too. 
if he kept the other things, like the hatchet, why didn't he keep the dress? And I mentioned this because if you go through the trial transcripts, I think we all learned a thing or two watching six weeks of a trial. When everybody starts objecting like crazy, there's something they don't want you to know, right? Like, they're, oh, uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. So one of the points that, like, every time it got to talking about the goddamn dress or what she was wearing and just his objection, 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 objection. Oh, oh, they did not want to talk about this dress. They didn't want to talk about what Lizzie Borden was wearing that day. They really didn't. Well, somebody did, but definitely not Lizzie Borden. And that's why it's very suspicious, like I said, that everyone seems to be helping Lizzie out by not recalling what she was wearing. And then when they do recall, it doesn't match the dress that she gave them at all and then the dress that she burnt oh that was something else wait how many fucking dresses are we talking about now so did they really let her have all that stuff in her gel cell i don't know um i feel like i'll have to read the uh read that whole interview and maybe something else to find out if she actually was allowed to have all of that <laughs> it's possible it's possible. Oh, Dana, you couldn't find anywhere for the free for the Ricci one? Yeah, I only saw it on Amazon for like three bucks or something. Um, it was a Lifetime movie. If you have Lifetime or maybe um, it was, I, I saw it on their website, but I don't, I couldn't pull it up, but you might just have to like log in or subscribe or something. Maybe try that. Um, uh, yeah, I think I agree with you, Jen. Like, I don't think Emma was in on it, but I think Emma was forced into a position to try to help and protect her sister. Because again, that mothering thing is there. And then... It's just really bizarre. Um, you know, Emma comes back. She doesn't know what the heck is going on. But she's she's there in the room when Lizzie burns this dress. And, and the whole thing about the dress burning, she sounds like her testimony absolutely sounds like she's covering. You know, she goes into great deal. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, she this dress. Oh, but it was so ruined anyways. It couldn't even be used as a rag. No, 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 no. Meanwhile, the dressmaker herself says, oh, yeah, it got it got uh, the paint on it right away. And then Emma's like, no, I think it was a few weeks after she got it. I don't know. Yeah, but yeah, it had paint on it. Okay. And then she kept on wearing it, obviously. And um, then she tells a very weird, suspiciously weird story of she came home from somewhere and she remembers trying to, to find space in a closet and uh, there wasn't a hook. And she saw this ratty old dress still hanging there. And she was like to her sister, why do you still have this old thing? You know, you should get rid of that. It's in the way, you know. It reeks of coordinating. It reeks of, let me find a way to like really make this seem like, oh, no, no, no. It was just a really old ratty dress. Well, I'm sorry. That makes it perfect to put on when you're committing a murder. Like they think that's the, the get out of jail free card and technically it was. Well, maybe not. I think being a woman was a get out of jail free card, but she's like, let's just pretend shall we <laughs> that it didn't have blood on it it was just ruined in every other way but it didn't have blood on it you know did you see it sure 
you know, as it was going into the flame. Um, and it goes back to how everybody's asked, you know, when they arrive, did she have any blood on her? No, 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 no. Okay, we're going to take everybody's word for it, but the first person to see her is going to be the maid. And if the maid was, for any reason, terrified, the maid's going to do as she's told. So it does seem like the maid was doing as she was told. But at times, like I said, her testimony also creates some problems. But changing the time that she thought Mr. Borden came home. To put it so close, so close. To her rushing out the door to go find help. So that she says, oh, I was only upstairs for like three to four minutes. I'm sorry, that's not even long enough for anyone to commit a murder. Like, no. So either... Either Bridget is like, yeah, I just walked past, you know, maybe the door was closed. Yeah, well, whatever, you know, as a murder was happening, as you do. I, I didn't notice. But three to four minutes, nah, that's not enough. Unless the person was literally standing right there. So I think she definitely got that wrong. I think it was more like 20 to 30 minutes. Which begs the question, why is she lying about how long she was upstairs? And Lizzie is lying about it. probably the whole barn thing. So, you know, unless you want to go with it was the maid. But then wouldn't she have been covered in blood? And wouldn't Lizzie have noticed that, hey, you changed your clothes. Did you take a bath? What happened there? Oh, you know, I was washing the windows. She actually has a great excuse for if she did change her clothes or was wet or had a wet appearance. Oh, well, you know, I was out washing the windows. It's hot. I was sweating like a fucking whore at a church house. I went to the barn, filled up my pail. I splashed the water. It flew onto me. Like, you know. If the maid had done it, she'd have the perfect alibi for why she looked wet or no one said she did. So, man, man if she did, I guess maybe they wouldn't have noticed. <laughs> she was washing windows. But the enemy of my enemy, they couldn't even get her name right. True, true, Jen. Um, and I don't believe her when she testifies and says, no, it didn't bother me. She did not arrive when they were children. She'd only been working there for two and a half years. So these were two grown ass women that just refused to use her name. I'm sorry. That's going to tick you off. That's going to tick you off. You're the hell by now, but eh, whatever. Um, thank you, Renee. Uh, I was a funny story. I was actually, so I, I had an audition to do. I was going to do it yesterday, but you know, Los Angeles is full of pyros. So I couldn't. So I did it this morning and funny enough, it's a, it's a period piece and Irish. They, they, she's an Irish immigrant. So I was, I was just doing it earlier. And uh, the name is Molly, I think, which is funny. So, <laughs> oh, so it wasn't that bad, eh? I, it was that was probably better. What I just did was probably better than I ended up doing in my um, my audition. I was so tired. Oh, I could still hear the boom booms at two thirty. I was like, "Fuck you, people." Um, Yay, America, but also can we go to bed now? Like <laughs> Oh God. Is there anything okay, Chubby, what you say? Is there anything to suggest that the one or both of the parents were abusive that might explain why the people were trying to protect Lizzie or maybe another story Lizzie was trying to spend? Hollywood thinks there is. <laughs> were you not here for the incest scene? Yeah. That's a thing. 
I don't know that they, there was anything, I haven't read anything that went so far as to say abusive. But this is not a time period where anyone would talk about that. But Lizzie was saying some snarky, mean shit. Like, my stepmother is two-faced. Like, there are witnesses who say she was saying that. Um, one of them is a dressmaker. I don't know if it's the same dressmaker or a different one. Um, and there's a whole conversation with Alice Russell where she sounds paranoid and, like, is trying to imply that they're all in danger. Um, and that's so conveniently the night before. So, but she doesn't have any specific person that she says is the danger. Like, that's what's very suspicious about that. Like, if, if you know, there had been this person making threats, if, if somebody had been showing up repeatedly, you know, angry with her father, if, if, if all of that had been happening, then she would have said, oh, you know, there's this man, he's been to the house like three times and he's angry and he's, I'm scared. She didn't even mention Uncle John as being like, you know, Uncle John's in town, he's bad. Cause that's, that's a theory I would have gone with. Maybe Uncle John was a bad person, but that wouldn't explain him killing the parents. So it's a theory um, that that one is heavily relied on, like heavily relied on in the, um, the version with Kristen Stewart. Um, it gets really dark. <laughs> I'm not sure if everybody wants to, to watch that one. Like, I don't want to watch it. Oh, we all just need a VPN. See, can I get a sponsorship by a VPN? Because, ta-da. Let me try. I'll blur out the dead bodies next time. I promise. <laughs> Oops. I can go back and, and do that. I think. I've done it before. Ah. Uh, Oh, the kleptomania. Yeah. So Basil is much known about Lizzie before the crimes besides the possible kleptomania. I mean, yes. Especially now people are like all up in it. There's, there's podcasts, there's websites, there's historians, there's a museum, there's everything dedicated to this woman. Um, and but the thing is, you you listen to one and you get one version and you listen to another person and you get another version. So somebody sent me um, a link to a, a one that's on YouTube. I can tweet it later. Um, this woman is definitely trying to make her out to be a very different person. You know, a good church going, you know, yeah, she taught Bible school. Um and that afterwards, you know, she, she, oh, and she loved animals. Like she's debunking the, some claim about Lizzie doing something to animals or whatever. Um, and she even has some like photographs. And I think that's on the website too, that there's photographs of Lizzie Borden before her death. Um, however, <laughs> the problem I have with believing that is that because I also watched something last night where they actually go into her mansion, the house that she bought after the deaths. Look, I totally get moving out of that house. I would too. Uh, whether you were guilty or not, I'd get the fuck out of there too. But she moves into this much nicer house that if you actually see, because they take you on a tour inside, um, it's not just bigger. It has everything, including like, you know, really expensive wood and really expensive fireplaces. There was something I heard, I heard the words Italian marble at one point. I'm like, okay. Um, it had modern appliances, running water, modern for that time, obviously. So she had an ice box and she had a bathtub and a t running toilet. She also had uh, parlors where she would entertain. So lots of spaces. And then Here's the one that really got my attention. A speakeasy in the basement. Now, it didn't look like what you think a speakeasy would look like. It's just a dining room, but it's down there because she would she made friends with people. She started to get into high, high society and she wanted to, you know, be a part of things and then she apparently started to get into 
Like there's the the thing with the actress Nance O'Neill. Um, and so these these people wanted to come over and they wanted to, you know, be able to drink what was at the time illegal booze. So she had a speakeasy in the basement. Now that doesn't jive with Miss Good Girl teaching Sunday school, does it? Now you could say that after the murders, apparently she was shunned by a lot of people. And like, so she couldn't even go to church. Like they would be like, don't sit next to me kind of thing. So maybe it was a re reaction to that. Like, okay, well, if I can't, I can't be here, I'll go make friends elsewhere, whatever. But, you know, her choices seem to indicate that she did want more from life, that she did want to live in a nicer place and be part of high society and, and maybe even be a little famous. That was kind of there. Um, she traveled some more, things like that. So it implies that, uh, no, she wasn't happy with her life before. You know, it could also be, okay, I'm starting over, but I don't know. I don't buy the the entire thing. I think like most people at that time, especially, uh, it sounded like her church work and all of that was more about the, the social aspect. Like that's where ladies, especially a 30 something year old who is single can go to socialize. You know, that's the issue there. Like where else are you going to go? You're not allowed to go, you know, to a bar. Oh, that would be scandalous. First off, they didn't exist. Um, well, sort of, but you know, there's so many issues there. So you would go to church to, to mingle and to make friends and all of that. And she did go out a lot. She did go out a lot. She was, she was out in the evening a lot. She was away much more than Emma was. So again, that, that implies that this is not a woman who was, you know, just this meek little, I'm going to stay at home and you know, knit kind of person. So I, I don't know why people keep implying that she is like, just, oh no, she's a good church going girl or whatever. I'm like, yeah, no, no. everybody went to church then. Doesn't mean anything. Jack the River probably went to church. <laughs> it was, it, you know, again, hiding in plain sight, hiding in plain sight. Yeah, Lori, apparently, I mean, that's one of the theories that the house and the parties, that's what caused uh, Emma to get gone. So, um, and I mean, ooh, could the money, Chubby, you're terrible. <laughs> could the money the maid got to shove off really been payment for a hit? I mean, if I was going to get somebody to murder, I wouldn't choose a maid, a 26-year-old maid. I mean, that sounds sad. I doubt it. Especially when you read, like, read what she has to say. Yes, so that's what I was seeing for the Lizzie Borden took an axe. Spoiler alert, it's it's probably pretty similar, but I there are some things that I recall being very different. Oh yeah, sure, they were totally Wonderland. They were drinking and studying the Bible at the same time. Uh, absolutely, and having tea cakes. Um, yeah, oh, ooh, can I, uh, Renee, didn't she befriend a bunch of Hollywood types? Can you find out about those people too? I can, I can. Um, to the degree that they can be found out. Um, I know Nance O'Neill or Nance O'Keefe. I, I think she changed her name. Um, so I actually, did I audition for that? I know I have the scenes somewhere. Um, Cause that's, I forget where that one's filmed. Um, and so that comes into the Lizzie Borden Chronicles uh, which is the series with Christina Ricci, which is very fictionalized. Um, they even have like other murders happening and all this shit. It's crazy. But she did actually befriend this woman or this woman befriended her, whichever way you want to look at it. Cause you know, this is the infamous Lizzie Borden. That would probably be very appealing to certain types of people. You know, 
Um, there's, of course, the claim that they had some sort of relationship, some sort of intimate relationship. But I don't think that was the case. I think I think Nance was very much a, like I think she had a boyfriend, husband, fiance, probably all three. Um, and she did eventually go to Hollywood. She was she was in like a theater company at the time they met, I think. So I don't know how much her her Hollywood career happened, but I can definitely look into it. I'm not sure if there was really anyone else though that became a big deal or even a deal at all. But yeah, <laughs> I just saw Dana say, I draw the line at watching Kristen Stewart. Yeah. I mean, if you want to watch it, you can watch it, but it's, it's first off, it's a drama. It's pure drama. It's not really a suspense. It's not really a thriller. It is, if you just watch the trailer for it, you'll be like, oh, okay. They're going definitely with the, the bad, daddy did bad things direction. Um, it, but it's actually interesting who they victimize. You, I don't know, you might be, might be curious, but, um, because Kristen Stewart actually plays the maid. <laughs> I think she just wanted to do an Irish accent. The Curse of Lizzie Borden, 2021 from Discovery Plus. Is it fiction? That sounds like something else. That sounds like a horror movie. <laughs> oh, God. Actually, I think um, Basil, I think Emma was closer. I think Emma was in her 40s. Yeah, they were 30s and unmarried, even in their class. Very unusual. It, it is, but uh, that's why they become spinsters, you know. Um, I wonder if that's one of the things that Lizzie was a little upset about. Because, of course, if you want a good husband... You got to run in the right circles, right? You got to be high society. And if your father is known as like a stingy man, even if you have money, that's not going to be appealing to um, suitors. And then if you're not allowed to, or if you don't really, you know, if you don't have nice dresses, if you don't go to the right places and who are you going to meet, that kind of thing. So, so, so she might have actually thought that, you know, she was being held back because of her father's like attitude around money. Um, Cause of that time, honestly, that's the reality. And the fact that she just never went on to marry, I mean, that could very much be because I mean, you, you know, once you're accused of ax murdering, imagine it's going to be hard to get a guy to trust you. Maybe, you don't know. <laughs> like, yeah, just no, it's okay. Just sleep, just sleep next to me. No, it's fine. No, it's totally fine. It's, you're fine. Everything's going to be just fine, dear. Like, <laughs> literally, I <laughs> mean, who's going to, who's going to want to sleep in a room? I'm, I'm even impressed that Emma was like, yeah, I'll move in with you again. <laughs> but maybe Emma was like, you know what? She's not going to murder me. I know. Maybe she didn't know. Maybe she suspected it. I don't know. I just feel like, at the very least, um, I think the maid knows. I think the maid knows. And I think that's why she got some money. Um, there's just, it's those three's testimony in particular that I want to look at. So there is one thing that I already somebody else has already caught the dress issues and has already compared things, but there's more to it. There's way more to it. Like they didn't, they didn't catch that. Um, the description of, of the dress that someone says was Lizzie's. I think it was Mrs. Churchill is actually sounds exactly like what um, Maggie says she was wearing. So I'm like, wait, what? They weren't both wearing the same dress. No, that didn't happen. Mm. <laughs> the Lizzie 2018 is free off. I wouldn't be surprised. Yep. 
think as for this lady, think as for how no one heard anything, at least for stepmom, if she didn't scream, they were hooves, there were hooves and wooden wheels rattling all over. And that could have drowned it out for Maggie. Sure. Well, for in again, allegedly, allegedly, when stepmom was murdered, Maggie was out washing windows. She's not going to hear anything. Because mom's on the second floor. Maggie's on the bottom floor outside, going back and forth to the barn, washing her windows. And yeah, so you've got, you got street sounds behind her. Yeah, there's no way she would hear, unless it was a very loud scream, which I will say there was one witness, and I have to go back, and I have to look at this, and I, I'm very interested because... There was one witness in the neighborhood who thought they heard a scream in the time window of the murders, but I think they said they thought it was closer to 11 a.m. And that goes into my theory that maybe, maybe Bridget screamed. Maybe Bridget saw way more than Bridget says she saw because Bridget was apparently freaking terrified. Like, Sounds like she was kind of way more anxious and way more excited and way more like, nah, and did not want to go upstairs. She did not want to do that. That was accurate. Um, everyone says when she was, when, when Lizzie was like, I wish she would go look for mother upstairs or something, Mrs. Borden. She's like, I don't want to go up there alone, which is smart because again, like Lizzie Borden doesn't sound like she's concerned for anyone's well-being. We don't know who did this. We don't know who did this, according to them, right? And yet we're going to stand in the house. We're going to invite more people into the house. We're going to ask the maid to go upstairs. They did go. She did go upstairs to get sheets out of a closet. And I'm like, what the f we don't know if the murderer is still in the house. But everybody's just like, cool with that, whatever. <laughs> like, goodbye. Mm, you know, just go on up there. It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. But it goes back to that statement that Mrs. Mrs. Churchill said where allegedly she told, Lizzie told her at the door, mother has been killed too. But then Lizzie's like, oh, I don't know where she is. But you should definitely go look in the guest bedroom, Bridget. Sounds like Lizzie knows exactly where everybody was. And Bridget didn't. Well, at least she didn't know where the stepmom was. I think, I think it's much more likely that she witnessed or heard something regarding the father's murder. Maybe she just saw Lizzie covered in blood. Holding an axe. That would do it. That'll make you scream. That'll make you run. That'll also make you go, uh-oh. Because you got a choice. If somebody's like threatening you, you can keep your mouth shut. You can do as I say. You can help me out. Or I could just murder you too. I mean, you know, take a pick. Take a pick. If that was the uh if that was the offer. <laughs> Yeah, go check out the trailer. Just, you know, um, the other one is just weird. Oh, you have some stuff on the, um, her friends and stuff. Ah. There's a lot of a paranormal investigations on YouTube, which is fine. I like, I like being able to see inside the house and stuff, but some of it's just a little, like stupid. Yeah, whatever. Oh, Okay. The Curse of Lizzie Borden is a para paranormal documentary on Discovery Plus. That sounds about right. <laughs> the family was cursed. I don't know. Yes, if it's hush money, the maid didn't do it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chubby. And it feels like the father's death wasn't planned. I keep saying that. It's possible that Lizzie killed the stepmom just to remove her from the will, and then the father found out. Ooh. I think, I don't know if it had anything to do with money or the will. I, I think it might've just been um, 
something building kind of over time. And maybe she just snapped and just wanted her gone. You know, again, what did they say to each other that day? You know, everybody's saying, oh, it was civil. It was cordial. Well, no one else was in the house. Maybe it wasn't. Um, yeah. Lizzie met Nance in Boston around 1904. <laughs> Ooh, how many men were available in that age range after the Civil War? Yeah. That's why I'm saying if you wanted a good husband, a good prospect, you got to get up there in high society, you know? Unless you're going to, what's she going to do? Marry a laborer? Come on now. She definitely didn't seem like that type. Nope. I don't think her sister ever married either. But her sister was like 10 years older. So at that point, maybe she just didn't care. She did move out though. So maybe, oh, there, go, oh, there goes my microphone again. Maybe she, um, maybe she was, maybe she was with a man. There are some reports of Lizzie having a suitor, letters and things that are not available to the public, but maybe someday. I, the, the thing I heard the other day was maybe the lawyer will like let his notes out because the lawyer might know who did it too. If it was, if it was her, he probably does. And that goes back to my, if you read the transcripts and you pay attention to what they're objecting to and how furiously they're objecting to it. I always feel like that gives you a clue. Like, mm, why do you have a problem with him asking about what she was wearing and can anybody describe what she was wearing? And did anybody ever see this other dress before? And why do you care so much? There's no blood on it, right? It's weird. And like I said, the whole, the dress they had that did have some blood on it, that they're like, oh, but it's just, you know, menstrual blood, take our word for it. No, I'm not taking your word for it. Okay, back to how random were the randos in the house. Could it have been a murder on the Orient Express situation? I'm not sure I follow. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree, Lady Grey. I think Emma would definitely probably have tried to be like, it couldn't have been her, couldn't have been her. Which goes back to the, when I say they were kind of maybe caught up in trying to help her and protect her, like, not necessarily they thought she was guilty, but that they thought like, oh, we have to cover up this burned dress thing because it does look so bad. Mm. Yeah. Wait, hold on. Yeah, I told you it's a very different theory. <laughs> Um, ooh, I could save that one for last if we really want to, but it is a very different direction. Um, it's just really depressing. Vengeance or a mental break of some sort sounds about right. That's what I think, statuesque. That's what I think. Um, 18 wax, then 10. Mm. Again, if you wanted to plan this out, if you really would like, like the, the theories that someone was hired doesn't work for me because you would not, nobody's going to choose a hatchet. Like that's not a good weapon. Use a gun. Also, you didn't know dad was going to be there. Blah, blah, blah. It doesn't make sense. I can understand having the dad killed, but why the stepmom doesn't make sense. None of that makes sense. There is a there was a case I haven't found it yet about another alleged axe murder that happened about the same time. But I said maybe it's a copycat. Um, people do that, especially when they saw how much attention this case got. People are weird. But, you know, they say a hatchet, they say an axe is is like that's a crime of almost spontaneity, opportunity. You know, this is not the weapon you choose. If you have choices, really. But if you're, you know, 
a good girl who's never killed anybody or anything and all you've ever seen is maybe like daddy chopping the head off of a fucking pigeon or something like you know that works plus i think that the i think that the first one is a little messy it's not as smooth the second one is easier cuz he's already asleep but also you can come up from behind this is so easy to do Are you kidding <laughs> I'm not even trying. <laughs> you really don't have to swing it that hard. This comes down in your face. It's game over. And this one isn't even that sharp because I throw it into wood. You don't need a sharp one. Um, I will say this is more of a tomahawk, actually. So, like, the head is. But they're all built the same. <laughs> just, to, just to clarify. But that, yeah, they... they that was rage. That was rage. And then I think it's I think it's also telling that um, you know stepmom got eighteen wax. <laughs> you know she's dead now. Dad got ten. It's definitely enough, more than enough, but less maybe implies eh, she liked him more. Yes, that's that's. You know, and I think that's why it became this big Hollywood thing is because the, the more you do learn, the more it does sound like they're just covering for the poor, innocent woman because. Hmm. Um, yeah. Wait until you if you start reading the trial transcripts, you're going to be like, whoa, but you should definitely read her inquest testimony. It's two, two pages or two way more than two pages sorry it's like two parts and um very very uh yeah you know i get that they're throwing out the morphine thing but i the question i have and maybe i'll find this if i can read more of the doctor's testimony is does she have any history of any of this where she was being medicated for fits of rage or anything like that because the reaction to to medicate her so heavily so quickly i mean i get that that was more common in the time but that's a lot it's a lot and everybody just seemed to be like meh about it i keep seeing this wire yeah the sisters died nine days apart i don't that happens a lot Happens a lot. Ooh, could it could it be fatigue after the eighteen? Maybe. Uh, so all of this you can do uh, lizzieandrewborden.com, I think is the one that has it all. Has it all? Hi toots. Hi toots. Um, do we have any witnesses on stepmom's character actually? What if she abused or otherwise mistreated the daughters? Maybe something happened that made Emma flee to friends and Lizzie snapped over it. Ooh. Um, I mean, the, Lizzie was going around saying she was two-faced. She was this, she was that. Um, she didn't have a lot of social life, it sounded like. But her sister testified and was nearby... I'm t nothing's popping though. Like maybe I'll have to read it again. I don't know if she said there was anything wrong. Um, oh, the sister. So her mother, her the stepmom's. Okay, Mrs. Borden's sister. Let me put it that way. Mrs. Borden's sister did not get along with the family, with the girls. Anyways, she did not like them. They did not like her apparently. And this is the one I think that they, that he bought the house or something for. But it sounds like it was always that way. Um, but she was close to her sister still. So that does actually point to, you know, we don't get along in this family. Yeah, in the Inquisition, she didn't have a lawyer and the doctor totally drugged her. Yeah, 
I'm just not sure that that explains all of her answers. I really don't. Like, especially because there's things that she said in the immediate aftermath that also create problems before she was drugged. Like walking up to the screen door and saying to the neighbor, father's been killed and I think so has mother. Or I think Mrs. Borden has been killed too. She left, but she came back, but I think she's been killed. Say what now? And then she goes on to say she doesn't know where they are or where the, the stepmom is. So yeah, she was drugged, but what I'm what I'm wondering if is um, let's just say that she was or had before had some sort of a rage fit or something like that some sort of a fit well you would you would probably break out the morphine for that right calm the fuck down crazy and this doctor who was there is the same one who has been kind of the family doctor. So, you know, Lizzie's in a, Lizzie's in a state. We got a medicator. Now you have to keep her medicated to keep her controlled, to keep her from saying anything or whatever. And then you can easily fall back on if she says anything crazy, like confesses to two murders. You could be like, oh my gosh, we've, we, we, we've over-medicated her with the morphine. So it can go either way. Like, it really can. It really can. And the fact is, like, she had her the rest of her life. She had the rest of her life to tell the story, to look for the killer, to say this is what actually happened that day you know because my inquest was this blah 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 she could have also taken the stand in her own trial but of course they were still medicating her but she could have said stop medicating me so i can testify in my own defense that didn't happen so it seemed like everybody was happy to keep her medicated so she doesn't say something or do something like but yet, you know, she still manages to faint. Okay. Okay. But like I said before, the, the, the thing that just makes me go, what? Is when, you know, she gets all the evidence and then doesn't do anything with it. She says, I don't care. You don't want to find out who did it? If you don't want to find out who did it, if that doesn't become your life's mission, the only thing I can conclude is you did it. That to me is one of the strongest things against her. It's weird that some people put it in a like, mean she's innocent category when she's like, I would have given anything to, to prove my innocence and clear my name while, while I was alive. Really? How about your dress? Would you give that up? Oh, no, it's already gone. Yeah. I would have given anything. Lawyer, just, just you know, I don't care what you do with the evidence. It doesn't matter. Who did she think was going to discover and prove and clear her name? Like, no one. You're the one who has to do it. So, very suspect. Well, that's true. A gun would have been very loud. But then again, so this would mean that the person who came to murder them knows that there's other people in the house. So that's where, you know, that comes in. If you're choosing, if you're choosing a weapon like this, you're, you're coming in only to kill two people specifically. Why? 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 And the biggest problem is that Mr. Borden shouldn't have been home. At least he shouldn't have been home until noon or so or thereabouts. But then you have a problem. If you're waiting for him to come back for lunch, then you're going to have a problem of other people being in the house and you know they're going to be there. So are you going to kill everyone? Well, you didn't. 
you didn't, and never was a, a person seen fleeing. There was never a report of a, of a person like walking around town covered in blood. So whoever it was would have had to ditch everything very quickly or somehow go completely unnoticed by everyone. And if you look at the, the town photographs, you'll see how close those houses were. They were so close. You're, you know, you're not going to get a, you're not going to flee the crime scene and not go climbing over at least seven fences. Like everybody's going to see you. Everybody's going to see you. Sure. It happened, but, and you know, she did say, Oh, there was a burglary in the middle of the day. Breaking in and stealing things though. And I mean, I guess, I don't know. I don't, do we, do we even believe that's true? Sure. Emma said, yeah, that happened. But no one had talked about it before then? That's weird. And Lizzie liked stealing things. So maybe she maybe she did it and she was blaming a stranger. <laughs> oh, why are all these things missing? Oh, I don't know. Someone must have broken in and stolen them. If that's, you know, the kind of thing she would do. Do I have a watermelon? No, you know, I actually thought about it on the on on Sunday. Um, I thought about it. I was like, I could try. Um, you've got to put it on something though, so it doesn't roll away. That's funny. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I mean. You're going to get a crack or two. You're going to get a crack or two when it hits the skull. But, ooh, 14. I don't know if you can hear it. I have my fan on you, but I probably can't hear shit. Um, it's hot, and I needed air. I'm wearing long sleeves, and I'm in front of two lights. Ooh. Ooh, she could have been addicted to morphine before the killings. Now you're on the same page. Yeah. That's what I'm wondering. Is there any indication that she was being, you know, that she'd ever been on this before? The seven priests and the uncle, though? No, we can't yet because I haven't gotten all those details. I haven't gotten all those details because that I did when I heard that I was like, yeah, that does sound a little too convenient. The problem is the family that he visited did back up his alibi and say, oh, yeah, he was here in the morning till about yay time, blah, blah, blah. So I'm not saying he doesn't he doesn't have some suspicious qualities. I would say, I mean, I'm not on board with a stranger. I really am not. So you know, prime suspects remain the people who were in the house. Minus Emma, maybe. Unless you want to go the conspiracy route, but. These three, these three, big problem, big problem. I mean, if, you know, you're, you're the last people to see the, the victims alive. Yeah, that usually puts you right in the hot seat, period. Right. And it's usually someone they know. Everything points to it being someone who knew them and knew the house, especially the house. But I keep going back to who knew that Mr. Borden was in the sitting room having a nap. Allegedly only Lizzie Borden. Even the maid didn't think he went in there and laid down. She saw him in the dining room or some shit. I don't know. So anyway, ah. at least yeah in the olden days that's why i have to look at it because i'm like did they actually talk to all the seven priests and they were like yeah yeah there there it is the uh, case files if anybody wants to this whole website has a lot yeah no one saw anybody disheveled body list that's why you know Again, if nobody was all covered in blood, then it had to be somebody who got cleaned up pretty quick. And if you're in the house and you know the house. Ooh, hello, Lori. Lori Hall, y'all, with an excellent 
fucking theory. Maybe stepmom caught her stealing again and was going to tell daddy so Lizzie killed her. Holy shit. That's not bad. That's not bad at all. That's not bad. Yeah. Or even just accused her of stealing. Ooh, she she wouldn't like that. Because, I mean, that's that's motive. It, it, it explains it was a kind of a crime of passion and kind of opportunity, but not exactly very well planned out, I don't think. Um, also could explain why it was in that bedroom. Because, you know, again, maybe they had words downstairs or in passing. And then, you know, she says, I, I, I'm going upstairs to fix the guest room. Or she doesn't even tell her where she's going. She just goes up there. Lizzie's all in a huff and a puff and is like, I'll show you. Cause she did go down to the cellar where the hatchets were. She could have also gone to the barn where there's probably a hatchet. I actually don't know if there was a hatchet by the barn. Um, the police say they found all of them in the in the cellar and that's where the wood was. So that's even more convenient though. You don't have to walk out the door. Just go downstairs. Oh, thanks Dana. <laughs> yeah, you guys, if you want to donate. Oh, cause I don't think I put any link in the box did I? I was going to go back. I didn't even switch to subscriber mode. I forgot. I forgot. Ooh, yeah, it was common. I know it was common. So again, and it goes back to the whole menstrual cycle thing too, because um, that like there is um, is whoever I got multiple people saying things now. Odd in 2011, 22, I presented information regarding Gordon murders, and it revealed Lizzie was blamed, but did it? But other did it as if whomever did it did not bathe. And then I'm able to verify it was Emma. I'm not sure I followed that. Who was the seven priests? I know, right? Well, maybe there was a thing. Boy Scout meeting? Too much. Was that too much? Did the uncle come back to visit? No, I don't think so. But so here's the interesting thing. He was only ever in communication with Emma, but not Lizzie. But that could also be because the mother died when Lizzie was two. So she probably just didn't get to know the uncle as well. But I think he fucked off back to Illinois or something and never, never returned or something like that. Ooh. Yeah. Well, we don't know if she did ask for the will to change. I mean, that's, that's Hollywood as far as I can tell, but the story is he didn't even have one. He didn't have one. And that's why I, I don't necessarily think it was, I don't think the motive was money. I just don't. Just like I don't think that the, the intention was to kill father. Like, I don't think that was it. You know, because he wasn't supposed to be there. So that's a bit of a problem. Yeah, there absolutely could have been hatchets in both. It's just, if she went to the barn, she didn't go very far into the barn. Because the police like really went at that barn. I think they were convinced that the murder weapon might have been in the barn. But also, um, you know, she she kept saying that she went out into the barn and that she was out there for 20 minutes or 30 minutes or something. Now, and, um, Maggie did say she she saw her go to the barn or come back from the barn. I think it was come back from the barn. But we don't know what time that was or even if it was just a whoop, whoop. And again, it's only Emma 
So they get the two people that are in the house. We have to rely on both of them. Uh, that's why I'm like, if we just, if we just kind of assume that both of them are lying, <laughs> just lying their asses off, this gets a lot easier to solve. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, let's just assume that everything you said is a lie. Then Lizzie's got plenty of time to commit two murders and clean herself up and have the maid help her and nobody knows anymore. Do what I say or else. <laughs> I could maybe see it. I feel like there is a need for an allegedly icon emoji. Yeah, we do. We need an allegedly warning. Allegedly. Um, Lawn Lumber said the family thought it was being poisoned, maybe a known toxin today that wasn't known then. The, I mean, apparently the coroners say there wasn't any sign of poisoning. There, Lizzie was saying something about the milk. What I think was more likely is it was simply food poisoning. And I don't know if they had the capacity to determine that, you know, because if we're talking about salmonella, maybe they didn't know what that was per se, but, and so it wouldn't necessarily show up as a poison. It would just show up as, well, you know, everybody was sick because they also complained about this mutton. Yeah. But I don't know if anyone else thought they were being poisoned. I think it was Lizzie saying that. She's the one who was going around saying this and, and saying that, I think she did say that her father said it to the doctor, but I'm not sure if that's backed up. Because again, she was going around at the last minute saying all these crazy, like paranoid conspiracy things. So either she was actually paranoid for reasons or she's setting the stage for when something crazy happens. Ta-da! Because this is apparently, so she's doing, she's telling Alice Russell all of this Wednesday night when she also was allegedly trying to procure cyanide Wednesday morning. And, and that was interesting because I think they had some, what, what Scott and Rob were saying didn't jive with what I read in the testimony at all, like at all. They were saying that they didn't know it was Lizzie Borden. One of them said they did. That they knew. They did. They didn't know at first that it was his daughter. But they had. They absolutely recognized her. They absolutely knew. And the other person went to the house to see her from like a distance, to positively identify her, and then it was three people. Three people were saying. Yeah, it was her. I recognize her. She came in. It was her. So that's three people saying, yeah, I saw her that day trying to buy cyanide. It wasn't just one. And it wasn't a, well, maybe it was her. Maybe it wasn't. So again, you know, testimony varying degrees. But ooh, like if, if. If she walked into a store and tried to buy cyanide that morning and then goes and tells her best friend, I'm afraid somebody's poisoning us. It's in the milk. She had plans. She was trying to leave a trail. That's why Alice Russell's testimony is actually really weird. Because she was her friend. It makes me think that she panicked that she saw things that day that she didn't understand and didn't want to explain. And then when she, when she saw the burning of the dress, she was like, I think Alice Russell thinks she did it. That's the vibe I got. And she was one of the first people in the house. But she doesn't want to say that she thinks she did it or 
even like blatantly say, oh yeah, you know, I showed up and she was covered in blood. Ah! Nope, not going to say that because you stood there and watched her burn a dress. Somebody probably told her you can't do no, 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 no. If, if she was wearing a bloody dress when you got there and then you got her to change out of it, because that's the other thing. Lizzie says someone suggested I change, but everybody says they didn't suggest that. And she, but she did change. So who, who, when, where, why? Mm. Very suspicious. Very suspicious. Yes, yeah, so that's true. I've thought about that. The kitchen meat cleaver could look like an ax, but typically they're much longer. The blade is much longer. Yeah, I mean, he does have a weird alibi. The uncle does. That's why I said, like, this is a whole other thing. <laughs> Ooh, the evil stepmom theory. <laughs> Wait, you got, oh, Twitter. You can't spam a hashtag. Somebody's reporting you. Yes, this is kind of what I think. Um, I think Lizzie planned to go out to the barn Again, whether she planned to kill the mother or, or it was more spontaneous, I think after the fact, she thought, okay, I'll go out to the barn and wait for Bridget, wait for the maid to find the body, right? That's the ideal scenario. Someone else finds the body. The maid probably screams. <gasps> you come rushing back in. Oh my God, what is it? Oh, Lizzie, oh, Lizzie, someone's murdered your, your mother. Oh no. Where were you? I was in the barn. Where were you? I was having a lie down. Um, yeah. Ooh, yeah. Bad rye causes psychosis, lead paint, etc. I mean, there's so many options for things that actually could have been making their minds go, well, um, was it Abby that feared being poisoned? Did she say that to anybody? I haven't seen that. Well, I see what you're saying. But it's not like she's a professional here plotting murder, right? That's why I think it was actually a little more crime of opportunity. And then there's the whole mysterious hatchet on a roof thing that I have to find out about. Apparently somebody claimed it as theirs, but that doesn't mean it wasn't used in a murder. Y yep, it is. It is as convoluted as Jack the Ripper. I'm not sure when the other murder was. I have yet to find it. I need somebody to tell me where to look because... I've just heard people talk about it. I'm like, so where can I read about it? Um, it was supposed to be when she was in jail, though. But again, how similar were they? Because yeah, it might not be that similar. It, this could be this could be something that turned into more, like the Jack the Ripper thing. There were all kinds of murders that they initially, people would initially try to say it was Jack the Ripper and they would be like, mm -mm, nope, doesn't match, not at all. And then it becomes that, oh, are these people doing it as a copycat or whatever? I will say this, you, you were convinced that she was innocent until listening to Rob and Scott and you, now I'm not sure. Wow, that's interesting because I, th I thought people I thought Rob's stream convinced people that she might have been innocent. I was watching people being like, oh, I think she was innocent. Because Scott definitely took it from the angle that she was, whether that was just because she was acquitted or whatever. But Lizzie's testimony was she placed her father on the whatever they called the couch that would imply blood on her dress. 
that was that was that was before the murder. Wait, what? <laughs> Ooh, we're missing someone. The police missed too. Yeah, I don't know. Go read the witness statements. They they chase down every goddamn crazy ass lead. Um. Okay, like, also, I don't think that hitmen were that popular back then. Were they? I mean, <laughs> did I miss something? <sighs> oh, did you find it? Five days before the trial and the victim was named Bertha. <laughs> I know I shouldn't laugh. <laughs> Bertha. Oh, so the neighbor's barn roof behind them. That's what I thought. I want to I wanna find more about that. See, it's interesting what isn't put in, in some places that some people don't have. So I'm looking at some CBS article that came up when I was looking for her statement. Oh, it looks like it was a special. 48 hours, of course. Oh, it opens with the crimes are so violent that many thought that the Jack the Ripper had come to America. Well, only idiots. <laughs> this might be the woman I listened to the other day, but I'm not sure. See, when people say shit like this, it just makes me angry. This was the kind of crime that just could not have been committed by a woman. I disagree, madame. I disagree. Very strongly. Very strongly on that. Sure, they prefer poisoning. Allegedly, she tried that. Um, but actually... I think the weapon and the way they were murdered totally indicates a woman. First off, if you're not if you're not used to murdering and you don't know anything about murdering, yeah, aiming for the head sounds good. <laughs> if all she's ever known is again like watching a chicken get its head chopped off. Okay, let me try that. Um, whack, whack. It just doesn't say. Because here's the thing. You want, everybody keeps talking about Jack the Ripper. When men murder, especially women, they, they don't just, they don't just kill them. They don't just bludgeon them in the head and then, you know, okay, that's it. I think there would have been way more done to, to Abby Borden's body if it was a man. And I don't necessarily mean like the art, but that's me. That's me editing for YouTube. You're welcome. <laughs> Just, you know, if it was a man with all that strength swacking a hatchet, I think it would have been worse than it was. We're going to do the next one I'm going to do, I think, is going to be the candy thing because, oh, my gosh. That's, again, another woman chops her friend to death with a with a real axe. Not a hatchet. An axe. 41. She actually gave that bitch 41 wax. I was like, oh. It's all over her body because she's just whacking away. She has no control over where that thing is landing. And it hits everything. Every. Oh. Oh, you think this scene is bad? That one is horrid. Um, and that is that. I mean, also, that woman looked way more petite. Way more petite. And she is swinging a full-on axe. Full-on axe. And she admits to doing it but claims it was self-defense. So that's spectacular. But 
Um, the axe just was like right next to the door. So she just chose the most opportune weapon basically. But this is a person who also never swung an ax in her life. She managed to do a fine job. I think people were really overestimating how difficult this, this is one of the most primitive tools we've ever had. Literally. This goes back many, 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 many centuries. And everybody's like, oh my God, you couldn't possibly. I have videos of me throwing them. Why do people think this is hard? Like, I should probably, I should, I, do I have those available? I could just, I can, I can show one of those. It's my own video. Do I have one of those available is the question. I have one of me throwing a machete. I know that. <laughs> the, it's really not that hard. Um, I have to just figure out where the heck I hid that. That says Katana. It's probably at the end of one of these. Not that. That'll get me banned for life. Ah! <laughs> no! Do you guys think that was too much? Disney's got me now. They're going to be like, Yeet! Copyright strike! I didn't know that was there! No! Uh, oh, oh, oh. There it is. Ooh, that's knives and hatchets. This is, I have to go way back for this. I have to go way back for this. Wait, wait, well, not way back. I had to go, wait. Hold on. I'll figure this out. I'll figure this out. This one doesn't have music, I hope. <laughs> this is funny. When I find it, then I lose it. It's fine. <laughs> when I find it, then I lose it. Wait, let me go back. So this is a machete. That's easy as pie. Those are hatchets. These are literally these. I didn't even break a sweat. Like, if I can do that, what makes you think some some woman can't swing it into somebody's head when they're like right over the top of them? I don't understand. Then I have knives. And you see horses. Those are flaming things. Ha! Huh. I don't. I think those are railroad ties that we tied sparklers to because we're weird. <laughs> who who was you throwing them at? No, just a target. Just a target. I have not thrown them at any human being ever. I do know people who do that though, which is crazy. Um, that's a thing. It's a thing. It goes way back. But yeah, it's not hard. They're not hard to throw. Ooh, the Valencia Axe Murders. I'm not sure I know that one. Yeah, again. That's what I have a problem with. You got two witnesses kicking about the house. Okay, Bertha Manchester found hacked to death in her kitchen. Okay, maybe I can Google this now that you've given me the name. Did they ever? Did they ever have a suspect in that? Oh, it is on this website. Exploding a myth. 
six days prior to Lizzie Borden's trial, 22-year-old Bertha Manchester was hacked to death with an ax in her home at Ball River. Killer struck at approximately the same time of day as the Borden murders, almost 10 months earlier. Okay. Bertha's 23 bloody head wounds were counted and described by the same medical examiner who autopsied Andrew and Abby. And in spite of evidence to the contrary, there are a number of authors who maintain that the timing of Bertha's Mar Manchester's murder so close to the trial of Lizzie Borden may have created reasonable doubt in the minds of the jurors. Yeah. Could be. Shall I show it to you? I think I can. This is, I can read from this, right? This is allowed. This is allowed. Oop, let me remove that. Um, certainly Lizzie's good friend, Charles J. Holmes. <laughs> so convenient name mounted a valiant effort to create such doubt. He filled multiple newspaper columns comparing the two incidents. He pointed out that both crimes, hey, is this the guy that was interviewing her and the other thing? I bet it was. Both crimes occurred within Fall River city limits. Wounds were similar in location and number. The assassin appeared to linger at the scene of, after the murders. The victims were slaughtered in their homes in the morning hours and valuable items were left undisturbed. Okay, in contrast, the June 1st, 93 edition of the New Bedford Evening Standard focused on the differences between the two cases. Here we go. Bertha Manchester was a young girl, whereas the Bordens were an old couple. Bertha lived in a remote farming area, but the Bordens were city dwellers. Okay, big difference. Bertha was home alone when she was killed, yet the Bordens were felled with two other house me held members were on the premises. And while Bertha's murder went undiscovered for hours, Andrew Borden's body was found minutes after his murder allegedly. Well, they do say like 10 to 15 minutes. It seems likely that people living in the Fall River area at this time share the Evening Standard's view and did not buy into Mr. Holmes' rhetoric. Research shows little indication that those residing in Bristol County, including juror, Borden juror members, connected the murder Borden and Manchester murders. Many citizens interested in the Borden case wrote prosecutor during and after the trial, yet a voluminous compilation of his correspondence contains only a suggestion of the reference to the Manchester murder. Ah, I see by the morning papers that killing people with hatches is a Bristol, Bristol County habit. That's hysterical. The date of the letter indicates its reference that same year. So was there ever, ooh, so he didn't even use it in defense. That's interesting. Wow, why would you not? I mean, as a defense attorney, why would you not? More than 80 years. 74. Hey, right before the movie. Goodbye, Lizzie Borden. Can anyone deny that this coincidence coming as it did just before the Borden jury was selected would crush the prosecution, exalt the defense, and persuade the jury? Oh, they were sequestered. How about that? This is, oh, the suspicion in the death of Bertha Manchester has centered on Jose, I'm not going to try it, Carino, Corino, Carino, what do you do? Look at all those names. Okay. And in... Portuguese laborer employed briefly at the Manchester farm. Okay, see. Mm. Okay.
so hmm they have they have somebody convicted of that one any work there sounds to me like a copycat right sounds to me like he wanted to kill his his this lady and he was like i'm gonna do it like that doesn't sound like he was did bolt i don't know definitely interesting definitely interesting but um Oh, they were there to kill the uncle? Meh. Why would, again, why would you risk that? There's multiple women kicking around the house. Oh, yes. Thank you, LJ. Um, I read this the other day. It was, okay, Lizzie's great uncle, second wife, killed two of her three children. Um you know, that they're saying like that would be probably considered postpartum depression nowadays, but that, you know, it also, there is still that question of whether certain things are genetic and not sure they would be related in any way, I guess not, but yeah, the, the Borden family has some, <clears throat> Skeletons in the closet. I think in 1984. Wait, what? Yeah. And he lived there. So, you know, you could say, you could say it was the same person who did both, but well, then he's in prison, so. But, you could also say that person chose to do it that way because they thought they could, you know, make it seem like somebody else did it or, but they were a farm laborer. So the hatchet to the head thing seems a lot more likely, <laughs> you know, but he would like, if they're a farm laborer, what would they be doing prowling around the city? stumbling into one house and how do you stumble into this house on the on the in the one time where the the back door might have been left unlocked because uh, the maid was out washing the windows and you come in and you wander up and you find the one person by the way you'd have to wander past here's the problem if somebody if it was a stranger coming in they would have had to walk past Lizzie Borden to get to the guest room because she kept saying she was in the kitchen, then in the dining room, then in the kitchen, then in the dining room. She didn't go out to the barn until after her dad came home. So unless you want to tell you, know, unless we're changing that story again, but um, if you come in in the back door, to get to the guest room, you have to go through all of those rooms to like get to the stairs to get to the guest room. So you'd have to walk past her at some point. That's the problem. See, you see the problem, the problem is always Lizzie Borden. <laughs> That's how she becomes a prime suspect. Oh, oh, it's in the Lizzie. Oh, thank you. Am I familiar with the Sylvia Lincoln's case? I am not. I'll have to look that up. Yeah, she threw them down a well. Gosh, so so cliche. Look at that. So cliche. Eh, words are hard. All right, this went way longer again than I intended. Hold your hold your speculation. Hold your speculation in, ladies and gentlemen. 
we uh <laughs> we got a lot more um wait i haven't heard this pamela says maid told her sister on her deathbed that she changed her story to protect lizzie i will believe that because i read her testimony And when you say one thing initially to the people who've arrived, and then you start saying other things, and then your trial testimony, um, even her inquest testimony had some issues, and then her trial testimony had some other issues. And it just it just comes off as I'm I'm not saying exactly what actually happened. It actually comes off as I'm saying what I was told to say. At times, it really does come off as I'm saying what I was told to say, word for word. We we all familiar with that one. We all familiar with that one. What I I think she saw her at the very least covered in blood, or with blood on her. I think it's also possible that she walked in literally as Lizzie was hacking at her dad and screamed. And if somebody looks at you and they got one of these in their hand and says, shut your mouth and you live like, you know, that's it. I mean, yeah, I know I've gone real dark there. I've gone real dark there, but her behavior that day is panicked it's panicked. But I think it's, I think it's even easier to believe that, 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 that several people saw Lizzie with blood on her and Lizzie gave an excuse or a reason. And they just were like, okay, yeah, you go get changed, you get cleaned up. Um, and then when, you know, the doctor gets here, everybody gets here and then the police get here and then we'll just say, uh, 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 Oh, I don't remember what she was wearing. It was like a navy blue. I don't know. Lizzie gives them this dress. So they all start trying to describe the dress that she gave them. She gave the police. They can't describe it right. I need to know where that comes from. Is that on the wiki page too? Are you just reading a wiki page? All the things I didn't read. Uh, ah. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. So yeah, Lizzie let it did it or let it happen. Either way. Did the did the mate I have to look this up now. She, oh. It's all on the wiki page? <laughs> Didn't know that. Oh yeah, I've heard this one. I like the I like the stealing something idea better, but Sam Brusina, Sam Brusina, gentlemen. Yes. Ah. Or saw her. Yeah. That's the other thing about the window cleaning and the which windows she's cleaning, when and where, and how do you not see anything? Because at one point, she's literally cleaning the room he dies in. It's before, allegedly. And then... There's this whole thing about did Lizzie did Lizzie close the blinds? Oh, there's a lot. There's a lot. Yes, Maggie Whitney her testimony. Yeah, 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 Lady Gray. That's what I'm getting at. I think so. So if you want, because again, Lizzie did not testify at trial. So if you want to dive in, if you want to go deep, here's where I started. I read Lizzie Borden's testimony from the coroner's inquisition. So it's two parts. It's kind of lengthy, but if you start with that, then you go read Bridget's testimony from the trial. She actually, she actually testifies multiple times. So you have to look through the uh, index and you have to find it, but also the witness statements. So that's what the police were taking down as notes in the beginning. That's where I thought I caught the first changes in the stories. I was like, oh, wait, whoa, hold on. Um, and that's like right after. So 
you know, people not remembering things, people changing their stories typically happens as time goes by, not in the immediate aftermath, right? So we're already changing stories. Then I went and I looked at, um, I did Emma's, I read Emma's because I was trying to see what she backed up. I read Alice Russell. I read Mrs. Churchill because these are the first people there. Uh, I have not finished Dr. Bowen, and, and he's like probably the next one I'm going to dive into. But if you read what Lizzie testifies to, and then you read what the maid testifies to, and then you look at what she originally said in some things, you'll you'll start to see it. Like it looks like she's trying to align certain details with what Lizzie was saying, which is interesting because. Lizzie didn't end up testifying at trial. Um, and then, like I said, the Bridget's testimony from the inquest is. Don't know when it disappeared, but it's gone. Which is really frustrating because I bet. I bet there were some really interesting differences there. Why does everybody love that theory? I don't think they were. I don't. She was a 26 year old Irish chick. She, I don't think she liked her. Again, Lizzie and her sister wouldn't even call her by her name. I don't buy that. I think she was actually treated kind of crappy. I think she was intimidated. I think she panicked. She could have been threatened with deportation. We don't know. We don't know. But she found herself in a situation where it was like either lie or die, maybe even. Because, again, she did not sleep in that house that night. She did not sleep in that house that night. Almost like you knew the murderer was still there, right? 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 I wouldn't sleep there either if I knew the murderer was still there. <laughs> uh -uh. I'm going to go sleep over here with my friend. Um, she didn't sleep there, I think, the next night, too. She came back eventually-ish. But uh, John ended up staying there as well. So very... I mean, all of the maid's behavior says she freaked the fuck out. Like, she was like, I'm out, I'm out, I'm out, I'm out, I'm out. She also wanted to get out of their employment quickly. She, she was gone. She was like, I'm gone. Like, girl saw some shit. And she like, nope. So it, sound, it seems to me like she believed that Lizzie may have done it. <laughs> Ah! American crime. Is this the um, the other one you mentioned? I have to write it down. Now you guys are going to do to me what you everybody did to Rob. You're going to give me names. <laughs> yeah. I've lost. I've lost the name. Where did it go? See, we were about to be done. And then, see, I was going to, I was going to, I just want to point this out. I was going to make it before the four hours, but now I have to look for this name again. Ah, where'd it go? Sylvia something. Where'd it go? Where'd it go? Where'd it go? I lost it. I lost it. I've totally lost it. Where'd it go? Oh, there it is. Sylvia. I've never heard of it. But she sounds like she's going to be crazy. You guys are going to bring me all the crazy ones. On a scale of one to I'll never sleep again. <laughs> when I Google this. 
It's all right. I'm now looking at these crime scene photos, like whatever, it doesn't matter. It's fine. Yep. All right, you guys. Uh, I think you have it the other way around. Maggie is supposed to be the I Irish slur. Or was there some other Bridget thing? I don't know. Yeah, I, I mean, again, she's only 26. She also had no other family in the United States. None. You can't get caught up in some freaking murder trial. I think she had a lot of reasons to do as she was told. It's just a matter of what was she told to do? Well, you know, just can you clean up some of that blood on the carpet there? Or um, no, you didn't just see me covered in blood. I'm going to go change my dress. Shh. I think. I think, I think Lizzie would have made it this, the story, made up an excuse, you know. Oh my God, I just walked in and I found him like this. She could have even had that. Could, it could have been one of these. It could have been one of these. You know, hatchet's happening. Hatchet's happening. The maid walks in or she hears the maid coming and because the door is open and she just goes, oh. I just walked in and I found him like this. Huh. I don't know what happened, you know. Somebody came in and murdered him. <laughs> and I, I, I and then like she like touches the body to like try and make the blood look less suspicious, you know, whatever. Um you're 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 welcome for my I'm I can't move my camera. But she could have even seen her with the weapon in her hand. But as long as she played it down, right, she'd have been like, okay. Maybe she even said, I think I saw someone flee out the back door. Maybe. I don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. She had 28 wax reasons not to ask quite exactly. I wouldn't ask no questions either. That's true. That's true. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. If she, if Bridget did confess on her deathbed that she changed her story, she probably would have confessed to witnessing the murder if she saw that too. That's why I'm, I'm leaning towards like she walked in and just saw something very questionable. So... It, it also shortens the window because if, if Lizzie had the time, knew she had the time to clean herself off, ditch the dress, ditch the weapon, then send the maid fleeing. Because I'm also not sure I believe the... Um, I went upstairs, I laid down, it was only three or four minutes, I heard the clock chime 11, and then I heard Lizzie call for me. Isn't that really specific? Isn't that also... You were only up there for three or four minutes, that doesn't give anyone any time to do anything. Anything. Again, even if it was a stranger, how did they get from the guest bedroom down the stairs into the sitting room, murder him in three minutes? No. They don't even know where he is. He went from room to room, apparently. Again, if you believe everything they said. For all we know, he walked in. The maid was like, oh, sir, would you like to have a lie down? And he was like, yes, I'm going to do that. And he goes in and he lies down. Lizzie never saw him at all until she pops out from somewhere. <laughs> she might have. 
Ooh, yes. That's a good one, too. She could have just seen the bloody dress. Again, she does kind of throw her under the freaking... Like, this goes to changing stories and things. Because I think it was in the witness statement. And I don't recall it actually being asked about in the trial testimony. So I might have to go back and look for this because it goes to the bloody pail, the pail of bloody water or I don't, I guess we'll call it a pail um, with the rags and all of that, that, you know, Lizzie says, oh yeah, I, I put it down there. It's been there for like three or four days. And the maid is like, no, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. This is, or this is in the beginning of the investigation when she probably didn't realize that she needed to, maybe she didn't even know it was there. I don't think she did. In fact, I think that was the point. I think she did not know such a thing was in the cellar. And when they said it to her, she was like, no, what? No, I would have cleaned that up already, you know? And also, this is very specific, but, um, and, and ladies, you know, you, menstrual cycles do tend to align when you all live under the same roof. This is a thing. It does happen. Um, and what it sounded like is um, no one, no one was on or should have been on a cycle at that point. Like, oh no, that should have been days ago. So the maid seemed absolutely baffled by this mysterious pale of things, bloody rags. And again, if you're cleaning up, perfect, perfect excuse. They don't know the difference. They are not going to be able to tell the difference. And apparently all you have to do is tell the doctor and the doctor tells everybody, don't ask any questions. It's private. It's private. And they're just like, okay, cool. What? Are you kidding me? That sounds like the perfect murder. Oh. Only we could get away with that now. <laughs> <laughs> They're gonna look at you like, don't care. Um, are you saying that's that's your reasoning for doing it, or a uh, questions? A uh, questions. Um, I can't imagine telling a detective it was just a flea bite, and then being like, I'm sorry, is that like the euphemism? Are you going for that? Is, uh, okay. Um, right. Just take my word for it. Okay, no, we're not going to do that. But thanks for playing. So I'm probably thinking way more about that bloody pail of rags than any man ever in the history of all time. <laughs> that's why That's why all the, the, like Scott and Rob, they just got kind of awkward about it. It was confirmed. Uh, how so, sirs? How so, good sirs? Was it confirmed? Oh, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't. That's the thing. It actually wasn't. Because apparently the confirmation is the doctor says that's what she said. There's no confirmation that the doctor actually like examined her. And that wasn't a big thing then. So he was just going to take her word for it. And sure, you know, maybe she still has some of the the, the rags and therefore it makes it look good, but yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Lily. I can't get over it either. The bucket of bloody rags in a crime scene where everybody's like, how could she have possibly gotten all the blood off of her? Did you guys look at this over here? No. You did, but oh, okay. There's a there's a logical explanation for this bucket of bloody rags in a house where two people have just been bludgeoned to death. Okay, sure. All right. Moving on. <laughs> I can't. I'm going to I'm going to pull all of that because you have to see the way it's described in the statements. I'm just like this is hysterical. 
We don't even ask questions, really. All right. Hmm. It is the weirdest thing ever. I'm sure there's a there's probably some biological herd behavior. Yes, thank you. I was like, yeah. <laughs> we need a debate thing about this with Christina Roth. I mean, we could do that. We could do, we could do they 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 were asked if they would ever do a mock trial, and that would be amazing. This would be the case to do it. This would be the case to do it. There's like three judges, you got, you know, two lawyers. You've got tons of witnesses, tons of witnesses. They actually had a lot of people testify. And a case that absolutely no one can make sense of. <laughs> so it would be a great one. It would be a great one. Um, I, I, I think I'm, I'm like I said, I think I'm going to have to do a whole episode. Now this is going to turn from two to three at the very least, which is fine. Whatever. Um, so Thursday, Thursday, we're going to wrap this up. We're going to wrap this up. Thursday, I'm going to go through Lizzie Borden took an ax. Now, I don't think I can use any screenshots because I know that I can't screenshot off of Amazon because they're, they're, they're shitty. So I'll probably just highlight the big things. If I can have all the stuff about the dress and stuff ready to go, I'll do it that day. If not, there's going to be another episode on Tuesday that is all about the things that didn't add up, certain people that just vanish from the story altogether, and all the potential mysteries. Like... I mean, we just learned about this one, that it doesn't sound, it doesn't sound like it's a good fit, actually. Maybe it is, maybe not. But, I mean, I guess, has Paul Rivers had any more tax murderings? <laughs> not, it seems not. Ooh. I do use Google Chrome. Are you trying to say that's the secret? I'll try it later. Was this more of a Dr. Curry note or a Dr. Spiegel note? Which one are we talking about? <laughs> Nobody in this situation is actually, I take that back. There's one detective who kind of sounds like a Dr. Curry. Did not, did not buy Lizzie Borden's for one second. This one was like, this woman is acting weird. Like, really weird. This ain't normal. And by the way, it's the detective who wrote the very detailed note about what she was wearing. And he's the only one. He's the guy I want on the case. Everyone else pulled up. I don't, I don't know. I don't recall. I wasn't paying attention. This guy's like, this is what she was wearing. And he's just, he's a dude. And he's like, it had a red ribbon. It wrapped around the waist. It has, it was pink. It had this flat, this, this, this deck, this uh, design on it, blah, blah, blah. This was the pink house wrapper. And this is why I say this is the only thing that the police actually dick, like, like notate that she was wearing. It ain't no damn blue dress. There's no blue dress anywhere. I'm like, where does blue dress come from? What the? That's the one they gave her. So, dun, dun, dun. All right. Ooh, settings and turn off hardware acceleration. I don't know what that means, but I'll try and find it. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's exactly what they do. Otherwise, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just old school it. Ooh, you know what? I could, I could literally, I did handwrite. Look at this. This is, I'm such a nerd. Such a nerd, you guys. I did handwrite my notes when I was watching it the first time in, in a literal, such a nerd. Um, but it kind of works, right? Kind of works. I'm just gonna have a murder board behind me and the string. Okay, you guys. 
We're gonna go from here to here to here. Um, There's more? Oh gosh. Don't move to Fall River. Good gosh. Allegedly by a satanic cult. Well, that sounds fun. It's always a satanic cult. <laughs> you know, it's almost never a satanic cult. I just want to say that. Um, first off, they have better things to do. And, you know, they're, they're not going to get caught. Come on. If you're making deals with Satan, you should be fine. You should be fine. Yeah, we know. Yeah. That's why I was like, the police, like, oh, everything that, everything in this case would drive every detective on this planet batshit crazy. In fact, I think that's the one, uh, I think the, the version I found, I'll find it again, that had the, uh, pointed out the, the coat under the head in this theory and was also like, there's some serious questions about the dress and things. I think that person actually was a detective, which is probably why I was like, yes, hello person. You're on the same page as me. What's up with this dress? There's too many issues with the dress. Too many issues. I bet y'all thought Massachusetts was safe. We did blue um, until now. I don't know. It's probably everything is probably better than Florida, right? <laughs> All right, you guys. Thanks for coming to my uh my my thing, my thing, my new thing. Um I felt very costumey today. And uh Thursday will be fun. Will be fun. Um I know there's probably some things I'm going to like. Well, I didn't even get into the cinematic issues. I mean, of course, I knew I was watching a 1975 movie, but man, the um, the slow zooms. That was painful. Oh. Uh, very little bit of soap opera acting. That was happening too. But, you know, overall... Not bad, not bad actually. Especially because I don't know what the budget was, but they, I, I will say this, they did not film that in Massachusetts. They definitely filmed it here in Los Angeles because at one point I kind of caught the Hollywood Hills in the background. <laughs> I was laughing. I'm like, you guys, this is because you can't CGI it out, but I can, I can see the, the dry, crusty mountainside back there in the back over the buildings. Um, it was funny. It's like right in the beginning, I think, or maybe when the crowd is gathering outside, there's one wide shot where I'm like, yeah, I recognize those hillsides there. It's cute. So it was one of the studios up here, I'm sure. Ah, yes, maybe you, YouTube, look, now I have to go back and looked like the universal lot. Wow. Did they exist in the 70s? Oh, yeah, maybe. Okay. I would be more inclined to think Warner Brothers. Although, I don't know if they had that part over there at that time. Because they started down here, literally, right? Like a mile north of me. So, But it's one of those. It's one of those over by the hillside. But it's now Warner Brothers. So it could have been. Maybe they did move out there that long ago. Things I don't know. Yes, thanks for everything. The lace was giving topic wise. But... We, we're going to have fun with this one. It's crazy. So if you want to dive in deep and read the trial transcripts, they're long, but that's where you're going to need to go when we get into the this is my theory, here's why, and um, here's why all the other ones suck, okay? Like, dress. Um, still don't know where the murder weapon went, but it's probably still in the goddamn house. You know what? That's my guess. It's still in the house. 
still in the house. We're going to find out one day, maybe while I'm still alive, they're going to be like, cause it's a museum now and whatever. Some, some, some kid's going to be cleaning in the cellar or some shit and accidentally knock a hole in a wall or who knows what something's going to fall out. And they're going to be like, Oh, look a bloody. Oh shit. Uh, Okay, I put my hand on it, but, like, I wasn't alive in 1892. I just want to point that out. Okay, you guys, here you go. I think I found the murder weapon. I swear to God, that's how it's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's a bed and breakfast. People sleep. I watched a video, and they were talking to the people who were going, and they were like, yeah, I think it'll be cool to sleep in a room where a murder happened. And I'm like, what the hell is wrong with you? That's not a thing I've ever thought in my life, ever, ever. I don't even really want to sleep in a place that's haunted, like Earth claims it's haunted. But literally, right next to where a body was found, what's wrong with you? Ooh. Ah. <clears throat> There's still blood in that floor. It's really there. Ooh, you went old school, Lady Gray. Put my money on buried under the floorboards in the cellar. I'm not sure there's floorboards under the cellar, but there's definitely plenty of options. Like they said, the doors are still the same. They did tear down the barn. They found a thing, but it wasn't a hatchet. They thought it was, but it wasn't. I think it's in the house. Time traveling, yes. I'm a time traveling murderer. I'm a time traveling axe murderer. There we go. That's the version I'm going to make. <laughs> it's going to mix all our genres. It's going to be great. All right, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And I'll be back Thursday at 2 for more, more axe murder. More axe murder. And dresses. And conspiracy theories. Somebody suggested I turn this into a podcast. And now I have no idea how to do that. Probably have to edit out the questions, comments. We'll see. Thanks for joining me on this crazy journey. Well, this this one did suggest you put it in the privy. So the hatchet is probably literally still down there somewhere. Ew. Ew. Actually, you know what? That was probably concreted over. So it's under there. So close to floorboards, how about under concrete? Yeah. Whenever that house collapses, that's when we'll find it. <laughs> yes, there's a bed and breakfast in a murder house. The Lizzie Borden house, the Borden house is a bed and breakfast. You can Google it. Seriously, Google it. Actually, go to that website and they have old footage of the house that's really creepy. I don't know who chose that music, but I want to... I want to kill them myself or just go to YouTube. There's, there's several new, uh, newer walkthroughs of the house from people who are staying there because they want to sleep in a place where someone has been murdered. I'll just post all these on Twitter. You can enjoy, you can enjoy going down this horrid, horrid hole. <laughs> Ask murder and dresses if you can show Maybe I found my thing. <laughs> We're going to find all the axe murderists. Murderists? Murder? Yeah, we'll work on it. Thank you. I was trying to figure it out, Lady Gray. I'm too tired for it today, but maybe tomorrow. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Till Thursday. Lizzie Borden took an axe. It wasn't 40 wax, but 18, 18, still enough. Nice. Have a wonderful evening and I'll see you on Thursday. <laughs>